Is it the wish of the committee that the bill be taken as a whole? There being no objection, it is so ordered. Uh, and I might ask, just for the ease of managing the chamber, that those that aren't um, intending on speaking on the committee stage at this point uh, head out of the chamber. The question is that the bill stand as printed. Senator Lambie, are you seeking the call? No, I have a question, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, oh, indeed. I have the minister on his feet, and he does have precedence, so I will give him the call. Um, thanks, Acting Deputy President. Thanks, Senator Lambie and Senator Cash. I just wanted to table a supplementary explanatory memorandum relating to the government amendments to be moved to this bill. Thank you for tabling that. Minister. Senator Lambie. Uh, thank you, um, Acting Deputy Madam President. My question is for the Minister representing the Minister for Employment and Workplace Relations. Last night, when I circulated an amendment to the NAC bill before we moved to the Committee of the Whole, you cried wolf about not having adequate time to even consider it. You said, and I quote, well, Senator Lambie, I don't think people just dump amendments on people and then expect them to vote for them. We will not be supporting the amendment. I'm reading this amendment for the first time myself. End quote. My amendment was one page and dealt with one issue. The government's amendments were circulated at 6.23 tonight. They're nine pages long. My question is simple. Why are you not giving us adequate time to make informed decisions about how these changes will actually affect the people of Australia? Minister. Um, thanks, Senator Lambie. As Senator Lambie would know, the amendments that have been circulated on behalf of the government uh, deal with matters that have been well traversed uh, in the public debate, especially over the last few days, uh, and they, result of, uh, they are a result of the discussions that the government's had with Senator Pocock. Uh, and on that basis, I seek leave to move all items on sheet PV124 together. Is leave granted? Yes, leave is granted. Senator Cash. Thank you. And uh, just moving on in terms of Senator Lambie's statement to the Senate, I do want to preface every single question that is being asked. I will say by myself, but I'm sure Senator Lambie, Senator Tyrrell, and Senator Robert uh, will agree. I just want to remind the chamber, and in particular the minister that the official records of parliamentary debates, which include questions in the Committee of the Whole stage, are a vital source of information when it comes to statutory interpretation. Now, as Senator Lambie has rightly pointed out, 6.23 p.m., the government's amendments to the most significant piece of industrial legislation that this place has seen for decades was circulated. One may say the government was treating the Senate with contempt, but that would be for some to say. I just want to say that due to the significant uncertainty about how this legislation could be interpreted—and yes, we will be here to 11 p.m. because there are so many questions that need to be asked and answered properly for the purposes of statutory interpretation going forward. We will resume, Senators, again tomorrow, and it is open-ended. But due to the significant uncertainty about how this legislation could be interpreted, which, again, one may say appears to be by deliberate design, it is important that we as a Senate, on behalf of every employer and employee in Australia, get clear and concise answers to provide guidance to those interpreting the government's legislative intent. In that regard, to be very clear on the Hansard record, I will quote section 15AB of the Interpretation Act 1901. Section 2. Without limiting the generality of subsection 1, the material that may be considered in accordance with that subsection in interpretation of a provision of an Act includes e any explanatory memorandum relating to the bill containing the provision or any other relevant document that was laid before or furnished to the members of either House of the Parliament by a minister before the time when the provision was enacted. F 
the speech made to a House of the Parliament by a minister on the occasion of the moving by that minister of a motion that the bill containing the provision be read a second time in that House. G. Any document, whether or not a document to which a preceding paragraph applies, that is declared by the Act to be a relevant document for the purposes of that section. And H. Any relevant material in the journals of the Senate, in the votes and proceedings of the House of Representatives, or in any official record of debates in the Parliament of either House of the Parliament. And so I say to the Senate Chamber, that is the way in which I will be approaching each question that I ask. The questions I ask are being asked on behalf of employers in Australia who this bill will pass the Senate. We know that Senator Pocock has given the government the vote that it needs. But after the bill passes the parliament, it goes back to the House, it will pass through the House of Representatives. The people of Australia deserve to know that the employers are able to properly interpret the legislation and, in particular, the hundreds of questions that are going to be asked in committee stage that, to date, the government and the department have either been unable to or have failed to provide answers to. And in that regard, before I turn to questions, in relation to the amendments that have been circulated by the minister on behalf of the government, can I ask when were these amendments finalised? On what date? At what time? Minister. Uh, thanks, Senator Cash. Um, the short answer to your question is that the amendments were finalised today, uh, but they, as I said in response to Senator Lambie, um, the amendments all relate to matters that have been in the public arena for since at least the weekend uh, after the government uh, uh, negotiated uh, an outcome with Senator David Pocock. Um, and for the benefit of the chamber, I'm happy to give a short explanation of what these amendments are. So the government amendments um, in relation to bargaining include among the factors that the Fair Work Commission must take into account in deciding which terms to include in a workplace determination, the significance to the employers and employees who will be covered by the workplace determination of any arrangements or benefits in a relevant enterprise agreement. Uh, they authorise the Fair Work Commission to have regard to reasonably foreseeable employees make determinations on views about whether certain working arrangements are reasonably foreseeable and amend an agreement with retro retrospective effect, if necessary, to address a concern that the agreement does not pass the better off overall test as part of the new reconsideration process. Uh, the amendments provide that employers who employ fewer than 20 employees may not be added to a single interest employer agreement or authorisation without their agreement. Uh, they provide that the operations and business activities of common interest employers must be reasonably comparable for the purposes of making or varying a single interest authorisation or agreement. They provide that for employers with 50 or more employees, the onus is on the employer to establish that it is not a common interest employer or its operations and business activities are not reasonably comparable with the other employers. They provide the Fair Work Commission with discretion to refuse an application by a bargaining representative of an employee to add a new employer to a single interest employer agreement or authorise if the Fair Work Commission is satisfied that on the day it will approve the relevant application, less than nine months have passed since the most recent nominal expiry date of an effectively bargained agreement that covered the employer and relevant employees. They provide that the minister may make a declaration in relation to a particular industry, occupation or sector to facilitate entry into the supported bargaining stream. They provide that work in the civil construction sector is to be considered general building and construction work, which would mean that work in that sector would not be subject to multi-enterprise bargaining. They make clear that work in the asphalt industry is not considered to be general building and construction work. 
they allow bargaining representatives to apply to the Fair Work Commission for an order permitting an employer to put a multi-enterprise agreement to a vote if satisfied that employee organisations' failure to provide their written agreement is unreasonable. Uh, the amendments also provide for two things in relation to flexible work. Firstly, they allow a pregnant employee to request a flexible working arrangement. And secondly, they clarify the types of orders the Fair Work Commission may make when an employer has not adequately responded to a request for a flexible working arrangement. In relation to family and domestic violence leave, the amendments insert new Part 28 into the bill, which would make technical amendments in relation to paid family and domestic violence leave to enable regulations to prescribe requirements for pay slips in relation to reporting of paid family and domestic violence leave so that it could be recorded on an employee's pay slip as, for example, ordinary hours or training. In relation to the Safety, Rehabilitation and Compensation Act, the amendments omit the prescription of malignant mesothelioma from the bill so that the disease can instead be prescribed by regulations under the Safety, Rehabilitation and Compensation Act 1988. Uh, they also amend subparagraph 79A of the Safety, Rehabilitation and Compensation Act to specify that an employee is taken to have been employed as a firefighter if firefighting duties make made up a not insubstantial portion of their duties. And finally, they introduced the ability for the Australian Capital Territory to establish an ACT firefighting advisory committee to assist in the determination of whether firefighting or related duties have made up a not insubstantial portion of the duties for ACT volunteer firefighters covered by the SRC Act. So in short, as I say, the amendments that the government has now sought leave uh, to move all flow from uh, the uh, negotiation that the government undertook with Senator David Pocock, and each of those amendments uh, has certainly been made public before, and anyone uh, following this debate would be well aware of the terms of those amendments. Thank you, Minister. Senator Cash. Uh, thank you. And I note in relation to the explanation that the Minister has just given to the Senate, uh, he has just read out the yeah. explanatory memorandum right. for us, uh, or the supplementary explanatory memorandum. Uh, Minister, I then ask, you said that the amendments were finalised today. At what time were they finalised? Did you withhold circulation until the start of the committee stage debate? And I would like the minister or his office, they're listening in, to provide us with an answer as to exactly what time the amendments were finalised. Do the government amendments reflect all of the changes announced by Senator Pocock? on Sunday the 27th of November 2022. I am more than happy for Senator Pocock, should he wish, to answer this question, but I do understand that the minister has circulated the amendments. When did Senator Pocock or his office first receive a copy of the draft amendments? Was Senator Pocock or his office asked to provide any feedback on the amendments? Did Senator Pocock or his office provide the feedback on the amendments? Did Senator Pocock or his office, or should I say, when did Senator Pocock or his office receive a final copy of the amendments? Prior to the amendments being circulated in the parliament, as uh, Senator Lambie has stated, at 6.23 p.m., did anybody outside of the government see the amendments, including uh, members of any union movement in Australia. And of all the government amendments on PV124, can the minister please identify which amendments were as a result of the committee recommendations, which were as a result of negotiations with the Australian Greens, and which were as a result of negotiations with Senator Pocock. And I'm happy for you to go through them dot point by dot point as you just have and advise in relation to the dot points that you've just read out from the supplementary explanatory memorandum, uh, whether they were committee recommendations, Australian Green or Senator Pocock's. Minister. <laughs> um, thanks, uh, Acting Deputy President, and thanks, Senator Cash. Uh, even though I'm a very fast writer and a very good listener, I wasn't able to keep track of um, the mountain of questions that Senator Cash just asked. But what I can tell you uh, is that I'm advised that the amendments were finalised at around about 4pm this afternoon, um, so not terribly long before the debate has 
uh, commenced. Uh, I'm also advised that uh, Senator Pocock and or his office have been consulted about the drafting of these amendments. Uh, and I'm also advised that uh, no parties external to government, whether it be unions or employer groups, were consulted on the draft amendments. Senator Cash. Two of the amendments that you read out are uh, as per pages two and three of the explanatory memorandum supplementary. Can you just indicate which ones were committee recommendations that the government adopted, which ones were as a result of discussions with Senator Pocock, and which ones were as a result of discussions with the Australian Greens? Minister. Um, what I'm advised, Senator Cash, is that, uh, and again, this has been in the public domain, uh, that the amendment lifting the threshold uh, to, from 15 to 20 in terms of the number of employees, um, the amendment that says that employers who employ fewer than 20 employees must not be added to a single interest employer agreement or authorisation without their agreement. That flows. That was a recommendation of the Senate inquiry. Um, in fact, I think you were involved in the Senate inquiry, uh, Senator Cash, so you'd be familiar that also the amendment in relation to the statutory review, um, I understand, was a recommendation of the Senate inquiry. Um, and I don't think it's any secret that um, most of the amendments have resulted from negotiations with Senator David Pocock. Uh, and again, I don't think it's any secret that the amendment in relation, amendments in relation to flexible work are a result of negotiations with the Greens. Senator Cash. Uh, could I just now turn to the second reading speech uh, to the House uh, given by Minister Burke? Um, in his second reading speech, uh, the minister said that, and I quote, bargaining at the enterprise level delivers strong productivity benefits and is intended to remain the primary and preferred type of agreement making, end quote. Uh, can the minister therefore guarantee that the percentage of employees covered by an enterprise level agreement uh, will increase? as a result of the bargaining changes. Minister. The, um, well, Senator Cash, as, as you've said, uh, Minister Burke in the House debate pointed out that um, the government's strong preference is that individual employers and their workers and relevant unions reach agreements uh, at the enterprise level. Uh, and we know that that's fallen away under the system that the former government presided over with the sheer complete collapse of enterprise bargaining. And we think it is likely that uh, the proportion of workplace arrangements governed by single enterprise agreements would increase as a result of this legislation. Cash. Thank you, Minister, for the response to the question. Uh, based on the Minister's answer that you do believe the number of enterprise level agreements will increase as a result of the government's bargaining changes, does the government see this as a mark of success for the reforms? Minister. I think there would be a number of marks of success of this reforms, uh, such as uh, getting wages moving again, such as increasing job security, such as closing the gender pay gap, such as increasing the proportion of single enterprise agreements. Uh, I don't know that there's necessarily one test of success for this legislation. 
uh, but what it overall the objective of this legislation and the measures of success uh, what the name of the bill is secure jobs and better pay in looking at the legislation can the minister take the Senate to those provisions which are intended to ensure that those businesses who have or wish to have an enterprise level agreement in place won't be compelled to bargain for or otherwise be roped into a multi employer agreement? Minister. Well, uh, for starters, Senator Cash, of course, any, any um, business or enterprise that is governed by a current existing enterprise agreement, obviously that persists and that business would not be, as you would put it, roped in or forced in uh, to uh, multi-employer bargaining. Uh, in addition, uh, there's, under the legislation as amended, uh, there is what has been called a nine-month grace period after the expiry of an existing enterprise agreement. Uh, and um, the, It is always open to an individual employer to reach uh, an agreement with their employees. And as I have already said, it is the government's preference that that occurs. Um, but we also recognise that there are individual businesses and groups of employees that, for one reason or another, such as simplicity, may choose to go down the multi-employer bargaining path. Um, I can think of many small businesses that won't necessarily have the HR resources to conduct negotiations uh, or, or, or would prefer to not have to do that with their own uh, employees and may choose to effectively sign up to a multi-employer bargain that is generated through negotiation by a peak industry body with unions and workers. Um, but as I say, it's not every business, pretty much every business <coughs> has the option of reaching an agreement with their own employees. Senator Cash. Uh, given, as I said at the outset, um, the purpose of these questions is to get a very clear guide from the government. Uh, in relation to uh, what the bill does and doesn't do. Thank you for the general answer. Can you now take me to the specific clauses in the bill? Minister. Well, I, there's no specific clause in the bill that um, says, in your words, uh, an employer cannot be roped into a multi-employer bargain. Because that, and that's because there are many clauses within the bill that provide a range of options for employers and employer, em, employees to strike a bargain, whether that be at the enterprise level or across multi-employers or multi-enterprises. Um, just because there isn't a sentence to the effect that you're talking about doesn't preclude the range of options that individual enterprises have for reaching agreements with their workforce. <coughs> Uh, thank you. Can I now turn to item 636A of the bill, uh, which basically states at the end of section 250, um, it provides that the Fair Work Commission may make a single interest employer authorisation that does not specify particular employees if the Fair Work Commission is satisfied that a, the employers are bargaining in good faith for a proposed enterprise agreement that will cover the employers and the relevant employees, or substantially the same group of the relevant employees, and b, the employers and the relevant employees have a history of effectively bargaining in relation to one or more enterprise agreements that have covered the employers and the relevant employees or substantially the same group of the relevant employees, and c, on the day that the Fair Work Commission will make the authorisation, less than 
in this case it's six months, have passed since the most recent nominal expiry date of an agreement for which the parties have effectively bargained. Can the minister confirm what is meant by history of effectively bargaining, as I have been asked by multiple employers, what is the guidance being given by the government in this regard? Minister. Um, thanks, Senator Cash. Uh, because we are a government that wants to make our workplace laws as simple as possible for employers, employees and unions, we have helpfully set out the answer to your question uh, in the revised explanatory memorandum. Uh, and on page 188, uh, helpfully under item 636 capital A, being the item that you referred to, so we've made it very easy for people to, to, to cross-reference against the item of the legislation. Um, what that says, and I'm happy to read it into the Hansard, is that for the purposes of, of new paragraph 250, subsection 3b, which I understand is the one that you're talking about, an employer is likely to have a history of effectively bargaining in relation to one or more enterprise agreements if one or more of those resulting enterprise agreements provided for terms and conditions that were more than a marginal improvement on those contained in the relevant award, that is, they must do more than simply pass the better off overall test, the requirement would operate so that only enterprise agreements that provide genuine benefits to both the employer or employers and their relevant employees would be relevant to the Fair Work Commission's decision to exercise its discretion not to make a single interest employer authorisation that would specify the employer and its relevant employees. Uh, this discretion would not need to be relied upon where the parties have agreed in writing to bargain for a single enterprise agreement as these parties would be excluded under clause 249 subsection 1 capital D uh, paragraph B. Senator Cash. Thank you for confirming that, because that's exactly what I had written in front of me, which now leads to my next line of questioning. Can the minister confirm what the government means by terms and conditions that are, and I quote, more than a marginal improvement on those contained in the relevant award? A number of employers across Australia would like guidance, as I said, statutory interpretation, in what does the government mean by marginal improvement? Minister. Um, thanks, Senator Cash. Uh, as a former industrial relations minister and I, I think a, a former industrial relations practitioner as a lawyer, Senator Cash, you'd be well aware that uh, no, the Fair Work Act as it currently stands uh, and which you presided over does not specify every detail uh, that the Fair Work Commission would need to take, need to take into account. Uh, that would, of course, be a matter for the Fair Work Commission to determine, uh, just as many matters uh, under the existing legislation uh, that you are the minister for left matters to the, description of the discretion of the Fair Work Commission. Senator Cash. Uh, thank you for that answer, but I hate to tell you, tonight we are actually discussing your legislation, not something that I did or did not do when we were in government, given that you would recall this is actually your legislation from the Rudd, Rudd Gillard years that you are now amending because you've decided it failed Australia and Australians. Now, the answer you've just given, I just want to confirm. What you've said to the employers of Australia is the government, other than saying that the Act itself does not specify each detail the Fair Work Commission has to take into account, you are actually unable to provide any further guidance. You have not bothered to provide an amendment to set out that guidance so that employers who are negotiating these agreements understand what is meant by marginal improvement. Minister. Um, well, I have to pick you up on one thing there, Senator Cash. When I'm speaking tonight, I'm not just speaking to the employers of Australia, I'm speaking to the employers and the workers of Australia, uh, because unlike your government, we recognise that there are two different groups involved in a workplace, that is employers and workers, and we think that both of them have interests that need to be met by our workplace relations legislation. Uh, but what I can say to the employers and workers of Australia 
uh, and uh, the trade unions of Australia, who also of course, have an important role in our workplace relations system, is that we are leaving a number of matters in this legislation to the discretion of the Fair Work Commission, including the example that you've given, uh, and that is nothing out of the ordinary uh, for the industrial relations legislation of Australia or, in fact, for many other pieces of legislation considered and passed by this uh, parliament. Thank you. So we have confirmed that for the employers, the employees and the unions in Australia, the matter is being left to the Fair Work Commission and the government is not providing any further guidance to the Fair Work Commission, the employers, the employees or the employee um, representatives as to what the government means by marginal improvement. Because again, this document will be utilised by way of statutory interpretation. Uh, is the intention of the government for the Fair Work Commission to apply a global assessment when determining whether the terms in an enterprise agreement are more than a marginal improvement, given we don't appear to have any further guidance, on those terms set out in the relevant award, that is, consider all of the terms of the agreement as a whole rather than a line-by-line -line assessment, which is the approach that the Fair Work Commission has taken when assessing compliance with the Better Off overall test. Minister. Uh, what I'm advised, Senator Cash, is that it would be a global uh, consideration um, as to the entire agreement. But I'd also remind you that in the explanatory mem memorandum, the clause that I just read out previously, there was some guidance provided uh, to employers, to employees and to unions and indeed to the Fair Work Commission um, that what the government means by uh, more than a marginal improvement um, is more than simply pass the better off overall test. Senator Cash. Well, I think we've actually now made it even more confusing. So what does the government mean by has simply more than passed the better off overall test? Again, can you quantify it in terms of a percentage improvement? Minister. No, I can't, and that's because no, and that's because um, that's because under the existing legislation, no government has directed the Fair Work Commission as to what better off overall is. That is a matter that is left to the discretion of the Fair Work Commission. Um, so just as your government and indeed former governments that have apply, uh, made provision for the better off overall test have ultimately left that to, to be a decision of the Fair Work Commission, no previous government has ever said better off overall means 5 per cent, 10 per cent better, 2 per cent better, not 1 per cent worse. It's been left to the discretion of the Commission, and that's what we're doing here. Senator Cash. Can the Minister guarantee that businesses who can demonstrate a history of bargaining with employees at the enterprise level and who wish to continue to do so will not be roped into multi-employer bargaining because of a rigid and impractical application of the, and I quote, history of effectively bargaining test by the Fair Work Commission. Minister. Um, well, again, I make the point that it is entirely open to an individual employer uh, to reach an agreement with a relevant union and their workers uh, at a single enterprise level. Um, part of the problem we've seen um, that the government is responding to is that the bargaining system that we have inherited as a new government is so broken um, that it is either unworkable for employers and their workforce to reach a single enterprise bargain or for one reason or another involving power imbalances and other factors, that just doesn't happen. Um, but it is, it is always up to, it is always open to a in single enterprise to reach an, an agreement with their workforce. And yes, both parties have to agree. That's what a bargain is. If you have an employer who is unreasonably refusing to bargain with their employees, then this legislation does provide other options. Similarly, if you have 
uh, a group of employees who are unreasonably withholding their consent to bargaining, then there are options for employers. That's the balanced system that we're putting in place. Senator Cash. If I could just then go back to item 636A of the bill. And as I said, it provides that the Fair Work Commission may make a single interest employer authorisation that does not specify particular employees if the Fair Work is satisfied that. And we've gone through section B. The employers and the relevant employees have a history of effectively bargaining. Can the minister guarantee that businesses who can demonstrate, again, I need this for statutory interpretation purposes, who can demonstrate a history of bargaining with employees at the enterprise level and who wish to continue to do so, will not be roped into multi-employer bargaining because of a rigid and impractical application of the history of effectively bargaining test by the Fair Work Commission, given your comments that, and I quote, the government does not specify each detail the Fair Work Commission needs to take into account. This is the whole point. Minister. Yeah. I'm not entirely sure what the question was there in the end, Senator Cash, but uh, all I can say is that I repeat my earlier comments that these are matters for the discretion of the Fair Work Commission. Senator Cash. Thank you. Uh, just going back to the answer that you gave uh, to the previous question uh, in relation to marginal improvement, and you said that no government has ever set out uh, a formula uh, by which marginal improvement is measured. Uh, what is the metric or metrics you are going to use to measure improvement? I mean, what happens if someone enters into an agreement and there's only a marginal improvement, but we actually don't know whether or not the employees are now better off because there's no metric other than the boot test against which we can actually test it? Marginal improvement on that basis means just slightly tipping over. Minister. As I've said, Senator Cash, if, if an employer has a single interest bargain um, that is within its uh, still running, hasn't reached its nominal expiry date, then they can't be roped in. Um, this is about, and, and when it comes time to bargain again, where an employer can demonstrate uh, a, or is likely to have a history of effective bargaining, then um, that's what these provisions would um, apply to. But again, I, I feel very repetitive in saying that um, just as the existing legislation does not give metrics as to what amounts to better off overall, because it respects the fact that the Fair Work Commission has some right to use its discretion to work out what better off overall means, similarly, what we're doing here is leaving it to the Commission to determine whether in the circumstances of a particular agreement looked at globally there is more than a marginal improvement. And as I say, that has to be more than simply exceed the better off overall test. Uh, thank you, Minister. Senator Cash. Well, the bad news uh, for employers. Uh, what I'm, no, I understand, so just take a seat. So I take your point of order. However, I understand Senator Cash has one more question in this line of questioning, and then I will come to Senator Pocock. And given that we have many amendments uh, to deal with, uh, in, in committee. What I'm seeking to do is to allow senators to go through a line of questioning on a particular issue and then move so that you get that, that opportunity to go through questions. So just for senators who have come in, at the moment we're going, th we're uh, going through questions 1 to 68 on sheet PV124 uh, and the government amendments. So, Senator Cash, if you want to ask the question, I mean, I have a series of questions. We're here till 11 p.m. The, the call will absolutely be shared. I have no issues with that. I do actually have some more questions in relation to this, but if you've got questions, I'm more than happy that you ask them. As I said, we are open-ended tomorrow. Everybody has. I literally have a file full from employers in Australia. No, no, and I have 10 minutes. So I have 10 minutes yes, do. to so actually talk. After this, we'll come to Senator. Pope the revised explanatory memorandum at page 189 
states that new subsection 253, which sets out when the Fair Work Commission may exercise its discretion to allow parties to continue to bargain for an enterprise level agreement, and I quote, would uphold and respect the ability of an employer to bargain with relevant employees in appropriate circumstances. Again, can the minister confirm what is meant by appropriate circumstances and can the minister please provide examples that can then be utilised um, when looking at this for statutory interpretation, interpretation purposes? Uh, at did you say page 189? 189. And would you mind just repeating the, the uh, part that you were referring to? I've got here, revised the end of page 189 states that new subsection 250 in brackets 3 uh, sets out when the Fair Work Commission may exercise its discretion to allow parties to continue to bargain for an enterprise level agreement. Uh, would uphold and respect the ability of an employer to bargain with relevant employees in appropriate circumstances. And my question is, can the minister confirm what is meant by appropriate circumstances? And could you please provide some examples? Minister. New paragraph 253, being an employer is likely to have a history of effectively bargaining, etc. Yep. My question is, what are the appropriate circumstances? Minister. Um, Senator Cash, I think the, and I don't know whether we might actually be working from slightly different versions of this revised explanatory memorandum, but um, the point that I think you're making relates to clause 1082 of at least the version that I'm um, looking at, which states that overall new subsection 250 subsection 3 would provide the Fair Work Commission discretion to refuse an application for a single interest employer authorisation, even if the requirements in new subsection 249.1 are met. Um, if the Fair Work Commission is satisfied that the authorisation should not be made having regard to current bargaining, the subsection would uphold and respect the ability of an employer to bargain with relevant employees in appropriate circumstances. Um, again, what constitutes appropriate circumstances is a matter for the Commission, um, and again, that is entirely consistent with the approach uh, that the existing legislation provides. <clears throat> Senator Pocock. Thank you. Um, some questions that pick up, a couple of questions that pick up on the question of power and and bargaining. Um, over recent months, the Select Committee on Work and Care has taken evidence from witnesses around Australia about the issues affecting their ability to put together their jobs with the care of others. An important issue has arisen repetitively throughout these hearings, the right of workers to disconnect from work once they've worked their paid hours. Can the minister please clarify how the bill uh, will address the issues of workers' ability to disconnect from work so that they can protect family time, give care to others and rest. Minister. Um, thank you, Senator Pocock, and thank you for your work uh, on this bill and, in fact, in this, this area for your entire career, uh, but particularly in relation to this bill. Uh, of course, the government considers that employees should be able to stop work when they have finished their paid hours. Uh, probably it's something that all of us could do a little bit of a better job of, especially in uh, public life. It is appropriate that employees are protected from the intrusion of work into their private lives beyond the, their contracted hours. This is increasingly important uh, as more women and carers form part of the Australian workforce. So one way this issue can be dealt with is through the existing mechanism of, in, of enterprise agreements. A growing number of enterprise agreements are addressing this including through clauses that enable employees to disconnect from digital technologies outside working hours 
with employers not to, connect, not to contact employees outside working hours unless in exceptional circumstances or for wellbeing checks. For example, the recently negotiated Queensland State Teachers Enterprise Agreement encourages employees to disconnect from digital technology and communications when their work is done and when they are on holidays except in exceptional circumstances. On the employer side, the Education Department in Queensland has committed to minimise digital communications with employees to ensure they have an appropriate work-life balance. It is also appropriate that award-based employees have the chance to switch off from work after hours. The bill adds both job security and gender equality to the modern awards objectives and adds two new expert panels on pay equity and the care and community sector. These important changes will strengthen and clarify the Fair Work Commission's capacity to consider award matters to do with the work-life collision, including such things as the right to disconnect. It is appropriate in our changing world that the Fair Work Commission is required to consider gender equality and job security as a central part of its role under the amended Act. Senator Poker. Um, thank you. Um, thank you, Minister, for that answer. Uh, that's a comfort, certainly, uh, to know that these matters can be dealt with uh, in awards as the changing technologies of work affect uh, so many workers with caring responsibilities. My second question. We've heard a great deal of evidence similarly around Australia that many workers in industries like retail, hospitality and aged care need greater roster justice. They need predictable shifts, a say over shift changes and the chance to refuse extra hours or be paid appropriate penalty rates for working hours beyond contracted hours. How will this bill work to improve workers' rostering rights? Minister. Um, thank you again, Senator Pocock. And this is an issue uh, that's very important to me on a personal level as well, because I've met many workers uh, in my career, both here uh, in the parliament and also previously as a lawyer for workers and for unions, who have uh, really experienced uh, this form of job insecurity. Uh, and it makes it really hard for people to uh, not only pay their bills, but to enjoy their family life and have other commitments as well. So these are really important issues. Our workplace laws need to respond to the changing composition of our workforce, with more working carers at work and more women in all forms of employment. And that's why we've introduced new objects in the Act and in modern award objectives. The bill adds both job security and gender equality into the objects of the Fair Work Act, and the Fair Work excuse me, Commission must take these into account when performing its functions or exercising powers. In addition, the objects of job security and gender equality are included in the modern awards objective. We will also strengthen the bargaining system so that employers and employees can negotiate mutually beneficial rostering arrangements and systems. Security of working time and appropriate rostering are essential components of job security. Predictable working time and a say over rostering is very important to working carers, as your question suggests. And given that so many carers are women, this also makes it a gender equality question. The important changes made by the bill will strengthen and clarify the Fair Work Commission's capacity across all of its functions, including in relation to modern awards, to address the work-life collision, including issues such as rostering, predictable shifts, employee agreement to and say over changes in rosters and arrangements in relation to the minimum length of shifts and rates of pay for extra hours worked. Senator Cash. Uh, thank you. I am going to just move now to—I I will come back to this section, but I do now have some comments and questions in relation to uh, the Common Interest Test. Um, I understand that section 243. This is something that I have been inundated with questions from employers all over the country uh, in relation to the Common Interest. This is something they have asked me to address um, in detail so they can start to get a much better understanding of whether or not they could or could not be compelled to bargain when they do not wish to. So the first question I ask is this. Under the section Common Interests, which is used in various positions throughout Part 21, of the Act. It lists three conditions for identifying a potential common interest. 
geographical location, the regulatory regime and the nature of the enterprise, and the terms and conditions of employment in those enterprises. Can you confirm that to satisfy the common interest test, all three factors do not need to be satisfied? Minister. Um, thank you. The, these are, of course, simply examples. Um, so there is no requirement that uh, any of these um, examples be met. They are put forward as examples for the Commission to consider uh, in exercising its discretion. Senator Cash. Unfortunately, that answer is going to create great confusion tonight across Australia to employers who actually are listening in to this. And this is the one section of questions that they are asking for answers to. You have said in your legislation three conditions for identifying a potential common interest, geographical location, the regulatory regime and the nature of the enterprise and the terms and conditions of employment in those enterprises. Now, you have now said, and I quote, they are simply examples, which now begs the question, given that is actually written in the legislation, what other examples do employers across Australia who, as I said, are listening in tonight, what other examples are we now talking about? Minister. Um, thank you, uh, Senator Cash. And again, I make the point that the government is approaching this from the interests of employers, employees and unions, not just uh, one group in this uh, debate or in a workplace. Um, what, the section, what the subsection says uh, is, well, it arises from the, the new clause uh, as to whether common interest bargaining can occur and what constitutes a common interest employer. Uh, and what, of course, section, subsection 249.3 says uh, is that the requirements of this subsection, which opens up common interest uh, bargaining, um, are met if, paragraph A, the employers have clearly identifiable common, identifiable common interests. Uh, and then subsection 3, capital A, says that for the purposes of that section, matters that may be relevant to determining whether the employers have a common interest include the following, and as you say, ge they are geographical location, regulatory regime, and thirdly, the nature of the enterprises to which the agreement will relate, and the terms and conditions of employment in those enterprises. So again, this is a matter that is, that is up to the, the Commission to exercise its discretion in determining whether employers have clearly identifiable common interests. Um, guidance is provided to the Commission via subsection 3 capital A as to what may be relevant in determining whether employers have a common interest. Um, now, again, you will have followed the public debate about this, and I've seen various opposition senators, including yourself, Senator Cash, put up uh, nonsensical examples which are designed to scare employers and scare employees about the operation of this legislation, people suggesting that um, a, a, a small corner shop might be um, roped in, to use your language, uh, to uh, some sort of a common interest bargain with Woolworths. Complete nonsense, uh, because I find it impossible to believe uh, that any commission exercising its discretion would decide that Woolworths, a Woolworths or a Coles or an Aldi or any of the big chains, uh, have common interests to a corner store that might employ two people. Um, similarly, I've heard wild claims by, made by members of the opposition um, that a large cafe in, you know, somewhere outside Melbourne might be roped into a small, uh, the same bargain as a small cafe uh, in Cairns. Um, again, it's a matter for the discretion of the Commission, uh, but uh, I find it impossible to believe that those sorts of nonsensical wild claims being made, that have been made by members of the opposition uh, designed to scare people would stand up 
uh, on any fair reading of this subsection by the Commission. Senator Cash. Well, it's just got a whole lot worse yet again with every word that you have just said for the employers in Australia. Because they had questions about geographical location, the regulatory regime and the nature of the enterprise and the terms and conditions of employment, you have now actually stated for the record that there is a whole lot of other common interests that may or may not be taken into consideration that the Fair Work Commission themselves may or may not dream up that employers in Australia are not aware of. We are now moving Senator Watt into very dangerous territory. What is worse is you have either just ruled out, and it's not a small shop, it is someone with, when you move your amendment and it gets up, 21 employees or more. We are in the multi-employer single interest test. We're not in supported bargaining at this moment, so it's 21 or more. For the record, are you saying that you are formally ruling out whether a small shop, 21 or more, so we're right in, will not be compelled to bargain with a Woolworths type store if they have the same geographical location or regulatory regime or the nature of the enterprise? Are you ruling that in or out? Because if you're ruling it in, we have got a whole lot of other questions. If you are ruling it out, let's do it for the record now, and then we're going to work through the size of business that you are ruling out will not be compelled to bargain with another business. Minister. Thanks, Senator Cash. And I'm, I'm sorry to disappoint you because I know that this will take the wind out of one of your other scare campaigns that you've been trying to run. Uh, but you would be aware that in addition to the, um, uh, common, uh, the common interest a uh, point that is, was already provided by the draft bill. One of the amendments that will be moved uh, following the negotiations with Senator David Pocock uh, is, if you like, an additional test uh, that would need to be satisfied, which is that uh, employers must be reasonably comparable um, to be covered by the same proposed agreement. And again, in the supplementary explanatory memorandum, which has been tabled, setting out uh, explaining some of the new amendments that are being proposed. What we have said at paragraph 71 is that employers of very different size, scope and scale might, depending on all the circumstances, be found to have clearly identifiable common interests for the purpose of bargaining together. This amendment would ensure that the Fair Work Commission must also be satisfied that the operations and business activities of an employer are reasonably comparable with the other employers. It may be open to the Fair Work Commission to conclude that, despite two employers of a similar size, scope and scale operating in the same industry, they are not reasonably comparable once the full extent of their business activities and operations are considered. So, no, Senator Cash, the example that you've provided um, would almost certainly not pass the, the tests that are being provided for, both by the original amendment that was contained in the draft bill and by this new amendment, which will also require businesses to be reasonably comparable. So sorry to disappoint. Senator Cash. Let's have a look at what <coughs> Minister Burke said on Monday the 28th of November 2022 in response to a question asked by Mr Fletcher. He was asked, Last Thursday morning, the minister told the House in question time that a small business, so someone 21 and above, located in a shopping centre with a large supermarket would not be compelled to bargain together with that supermarket. Given the bill specifically mentions geographical location as establishing the common interest, uh, that means a business can be dragged into multi-employer bargaining. Minister Burke came back, though, with the example is wrong, as you have now stated, and that's good because we're going to rule it out formally for the reason for statutory interpretation, so that's going to give a lot of relief to people when we formally rule out this. He says the first reason is in terms of common interest. He talks about the common interest, not comparability, the common interest. So let's put comparability aside. Excuse me. He then says, so even if you got over the hurdle of common interest, and I don't know logically how you could get over the hurdle on common interest, 
To claim that they're somehow reasonably comparable would just beg up belief. So can we go back to the common interest? Are you now saying that they are ruled out of the common interest? Minister. Well, Senator Cash, I think in <coughs> quoting Minister Burke, you've answered your own question because I didn't catch every single word of what he said there, but I think he said something along the lines that it defies belief or defies logic um, that it would pass the common interest test. So the answer is there in what you've quoted. Minister Cash. So in terms of the number of employees, because again this is very, very important, if we go to reasonably comparable, you've said with certainty 21, you're out. We're no longer reasonably comparable. What happens if we're at 50? Are we ruling in or are we ruling out in terms of this example? Where are you drawing the line? Because this is of now great use to employers around Australia because they will be able to say to the Fair Work Commission, Minister, what has ruled us formally out on behalf of the government? So 21 we're ruled out. That's good news for those with 21. 25, 35, 50. What are you formally ruling in and ruling out by way of numbers? Minister. Minister. Um, thanks, Senator Cash. The, um, I, I don't think it's. I don't think Senator Cash has accurately characterised what I've said. There are the the bill is very clear that employers who employ fewer than 20 employees may not be added to a single interest employer agreement or authorisation without their agreement. If there are 20 or more employees, then there are additional tests that need to be met for an employer um, to be added to a single interest employer agreement. And they are, in short, um, that they have to have common interests, clearly identifiable common interests with, employ with other employers. And as I say, the, th the factors that the Commission can take into account uh, in determining whether employers have a common interest include, include uh, geographical location, regulatory regime and the nature of the enterprises uh, to which the agreement will relate and the terms of com conditions of employment in those enterprises. And in addition to that, for a business that employs over 20 employees, um, then they also have to be demonstrated to be reasonably comparable to the other businesses. So that, that is what is actually provided for by this bill, rather than however Senator Cash might uh, try to characterise it. In addition to all of that, uh, as Senator Cash would be aware, the government has reached agreement with Senator David Pocock that um, we, would, we are making an additional amendment which provides that for employers with 50 or more employees, the onus is on the employer to establish that it is not a common interest employer or its operations and business activities are not reasonably comparable with the empl other employers. But businesses with employing f uh, f uh, fewer than 50, uh, the onus is on employees to establish that. Senator Cash. Uh, we were talking 21 and above. I understand the issue in relation to 20 and below. You can actually be compelled into the supported bargaining stream. We've got a whole line of questions there in relation to compelling small businesses. Um, but we are focusing on oh, the me. single interest you don't have the call. test. Can we go back then to geographical location? Putting aside comparability, we've got to satisfy the common interest first. In questions to the department, we have got no further in relation to any guidance on what geographical location actually means. So before we go through a set of specific questions, can you actually tell me what does the government actually mean by geographical location? Minister. I suspect I'll be saying this a fair bit tonight, but that is obviously a matter for the discretion of the Commission. Uh, but I respect the Commission uh, enough to think that it's capable of determining um, what is a common geographical location um, for the purposes of this section. But essentially what we're ruling out by saying this is uh, a, a, um, businesses that are on opposite sides of the coast 
um, forming uh, part of the same agreement through this stream. Senator Cash. One of the issues that I'm having, and this is why we will continue to ask these questions, and I'm glad you know the answer is it's up to the Fair Work Commission, is the government keeps saying that this bill is meant to make it more simple and easier for businesses to bargain. I am actually asking you questions on behalf of employers in this country. I didn't dream these up. Employers did in Australia. And to date, every single answer, because they're listening in, that they are being provided with is the government's not making it easier. There's nothing further for you to read. Go right through all of these questions. There's nothing further for you to read. I can read from the explanatory memorandum, but that's actually where all the questions are coming from. I can look to Tony Burke, Minister Burke, who, who insults the opposition in question time. Well, that actually doesn't help me because we won't formally rule something in or formally rule something out. You keep saying you're making it more simple for business, but what we are now working through, and we've only been here for an hour and a half, we've got a long way to go, is that, and I quote, it is being left to the discretion of the Fair Work Commission. Geographical location. We will get on to what you've said. We're going to rule out coast to coast, because that's going to help me in Western Australia, ruling out that anyone in the Western Australian mining industry is going to be compelled to bargain with anyone on. You've said the East Coast. I'll get your definition of the East Coast, because that is also going to be very important going forward by way of statutory interpretation. So, Going back to geographical location. It is being left to the discretion of the Fair Work Commission, other than, and we'll get back to, I've got a whole series of questions provided by the Western Australian mining industry. Does this legislation set a distance limit when considering a shared geographical location as a common interest? We've ruled out coast to coast, so I also need to understand, in ruling out coast to coast by way of geographical location, how did you do that? I need to understand why, because then we can actually start to work backwards. We've now got a distance, coast to coast. Minister. Uh, well, the answer to your question is no. The legislation clearly doesn't set geographical limits. Uh, that's obvious from reading the legislation. Senator Cash. The legislation itself may not. But as you know, we're talking statutory interpretation tonight. I'm asking very deliberate questions to get very deliberate answers. You are on the Hansard record as ruling out coast to coast. What does coast to coast mean? Because I've got some in the mining and resources sector that are relying on these answers in the event they need to. Minister. I can't add anything to what I've already said. Senator Cash. In terms of being compelled to bargain, how many employees does a business require before it could be compelled to bargain with a large business? Minister. Depending exactly what you're um, trying to establish, uh, Senator Cash, um, the, uh, I mean, the, there obviously is the provision in the bill um, that exempts businesses under 20 employees uh, from being, in your words, compelled to be part of uh, a single interest bargain. bargain. Um, I mean, there are a lot of employers that are quite happy to do this. Uh, is the other point worth observing? And there are a lot of employees who are quite happy to do this. Um, there's a lot of people who don't need to be compelled to do anything uh, because they choose to undertake bargaining with their employees. Um, so, I think that's probably the simplest answer: is to just refer you back uh, to the thresholds that I've already discussed. Senator Cash. Uh, and just to be clear. I've already ruled out we're not talking about supported bargaining. So let's put anyone under. I would actually say 16 at the moment, 
but I understand the amendment will go through. So I am giving you the benefit of that doubt before a vote has been cast and saying 21. So it's 21 or above. You may define that as a medium-sized business. I still think it's a pretty small business. Let's talk in terms of numbers. 21, head count. How many employees does a business that sits within the single interest stream require before it could be compelled to bargain with a large business? Now, if you're saying you don't know, that's fine, you don't know. If you're saying that's left to the discretion of the Fair Work Commission, I'm happy to accept that answer as well. Minister. Um, I think there's a bit of a false premise going on here, Senator Cash. The, um, as you know, should the amendment go through, and I'd be very happy to put it to a vote if you'd like to do so, um, the, uh, what the bill will provide is that employers who employ fewer than 20 employees may not be added to a single interest employer agreement or authorisation without their agreement. Once we get over that 20 number, then again, it's a matter for whether the majority of the workforce wishes uh, to be part of a single interest em uh, employer agreement uh, and all of the usual factors that would need to be met um, to enter a single interest employer agreement would have to be met. So there's no numerical, um, uh, no particular number. There's a range of other factors that are provided for for employers and employees who choose to go down this path. Senator Cash. Thank you. 21 and above, and you're in. Thank you. Well, only if no, for, are, if correct. The for the numbers, are though. Met. Correct. We're yeah. not ruling anyone in and out. 21 plus, you're in. Thank you. Oh, God, it's just got worse. 20, I want to start with 21, seriously. 20. Uh, talking about geographical location again, we've ruled out coast to coast, so I just want to understand that a little more. What about a mining company in central Australia and on the west coast? Could they be compelled on the basis you have formally ruled out coast to coast? Senator Cash, it may surprise you to know that I was not one of the people that you appointed to the Fair Work Commission uh, when you were the minister. I obviously didn't tick the right boxes, so I'm not in a position to uh, prejudge what the commission will decide. Senator Cash. Thank you. So we're not ruling it out. Thank you very much. But I do then need you to clarify when it comes to what you've stated in relation to coast to coast, I do now need to understand what do you mean as the minister in the government who's put this legislation forward? Because again, the Fair Work Commission, the employers will have this. They will have this in front of them. And they'll be able to point to Minister Watt on behalf of the government ruled out coast to coast. I need to understand now there are a lot of companies in Australia who have raised this with me not just in the mining and resources sector. I need to understand what the Albanese government means by you ruling out coast to coast. Minister. Um, thanks, uh, Deputy President. I would have thought it's pretty obvious what uh, anyone means when they're talking about coast to coast to coast, uh, but uh, it is the government's all of these matters are, as I say, matters for the Fair Work Commission to determine independently, uh, but uh, it is very hard to imagine that, a that any commissioner would consider that a small retail outlet in Perth uh, would, be, would have common interests and would be reasonably comparable to a larger retail outlet in, say, Brisbane on the other side of the coast. Senator Cash. Um, what is your legal definition of very hard to imagine? 
Minister. These are all matters for the Commission's discretion. Senator Cash. If two businesses are in the same shopping centre, do they share a geographical location? It's a matter for the Commission. Uh, could a hardware store next to a hairdresser be compelled to bargain together under the geographic location common interest test? So they're next door, hardware store, next door to this hairdresser, we're in the same geographic location. If they both remember, we're talking 21 and above, so we're in the single interest stream. Can they be compelled to bargain together under the geographic location? Put aside the other elements. I'm talking here specifically about geographic location. Minister. It's a matter for the Commission. Senator Cash. If two businesses are within one kilometre of each other, do they share a geographical location under the common interest test? Minister. It's a matter for the Commission, as is the answer to your next question and the one after that, I suspect. Senator Cash. Well, my next question was actually, can you guarantee that the public interest test will prevent multi-employer strikes that shut down an entire port? So the bad news for anyone in that industry, for anyone in a supply chain, the National Farmers Federation, anyone in the mining and resources sector, anyone in a supply chain, any Australian who may want to see their food get to uh, the supermarket, can you guarantee that the public interest trust will prevent multi-employer strikes that shut down an entire port? The answer to that question, thank you very much, is it is a matter for the Commission. You also said you'd answer my next question in relation uh, with that is a matter for the Commission. So I would also going to ask you, can you guarantee that the public interest test will prevent targeted efforts to pressure an employer by coordinating industrial action against its suppliers or customers who are also part of the same multi-employer agreement. The good news or the bad news for employers across Australia uh, is that that's also a matter for the Fair Work Commission. So now I'll move on to my next question. Can you explain what common interest means in the single interest stream? Minister. Uh, well, of course, I reject uh, Senator Cash's uh, characterisation of my answers to questions that she didn't actually put to me. Um, the, in terms of strikes, again, this is a. Uh, I know that Senator Cash has spent months now trying to run a campaign along with her colleagues that these laws will lead to nationwide strikes. They'll lead to strikes in every business every port, every train station, every shop, every childcare centre. I know that's what Senator Cash is saying, uh, and that's because the coalition are addicted to conflict in our workplace relations schemes. Um, it might be hard to accept for members of the coalition who have for 10 years driven a conflict-based, low wages, low productivity, um, detrimental to the, to the economy IR system, but there is another way. Uh, and that is the way that the government is putting forward. It's a way that's based on agreements rather than conflict. It is not the intention of these reforms to allow for industry-wide strikes, despite what Senator Cash and her colleagues keep saying. These are multi-enterprise agreements, not industry-wide agreements. Uh, an industri industrial action will be permitted for the single interest stream and supporting, supported bargaining stream, but with safeguards in place. And I don't know how many times I've told Senator Cash this in estimates, in the chamber, uh, in the public debate, elsewhere, and for her own reasons, she chooses to ignore uh, the facts and ignore what the government has repeatedly said, which is that, that in, in actual fact, there will be stronger safeguards against industrial action being taken uh, under this legislation that the government is putting forward than exist at the moment. Now, I know that doesn't suit the, the opposition's narrative, uh, which is that industrial mayhem will result from these laws. Um, but, as I say, we are choosing a different path, and that is one that's based on agreements rather than conflict. Uh, in answer to the question, I can't do any more than what I've already said, uh, which is that uh, the, the, the matters um, that 
uh, Senator Cash is talking about, about what amounts to common interest, uh, either set out clearly in the legislation or are matters for the, dis the discretion of the Commission? Senator Cash. Um, you just said, well, in the first instance, what I would say is political commentary doesn't assist statutory interpretation, but you would know that. Um, you've also just said that suggesting strikes would increase was actually scaremongering on behalf of the opposition. So can you confirm this legislation will not increase strike action? Minister. Uh, as I say, it is not the intention of these reforms uh, to allow for increased industrial action, uh, whether it be by employees or employers. And I note uh, that only in the last couple of days uh, we've seen notification of, a, of an impending strike um, uh, involving uh, uh, firefighters at airports, and that has happened under the existing legislation of the government. Strikes happen under the existing legislation, um, and I suspect that under any legislation um, that any government put through this parliament, there would be forms of industrial action taken. Uh, but it is not the intention of these reforms uh, to allow for industry-wide strikes in the way that the opposition keeps claiming will occur. Senator Cash. Uh, just going back to uh, the multi-employer agreements in the single interest stream, um, can you guarantee that a multi-employer agreement in the single interest stream cannot be used to capture employers in different states and territories. Again, I just need this for guidance for employers. Minister. Again, that's a matter for the uh, discretion of the Commission. Senator Cash. Just in terms of your response in relation to the strike action, and you said it was not the intention of the legislation. Um, if it wasn't the intention of the legislation, one might ask, well, then why did you actually open up an additional avenue uh, of strike action? But you said it's not the intention of the legislation. The issue I now have is there could be unintended consequences. Uh, in the event uh, that when this legislation is passed, um, we do see an increase in strike action, what will the government do? Minister. Um, well, the, as I say, far from the coalition's claim that this will lead to industry-wide strike action, um, as I've said, there are additional safeguards or requirements that are being proposed as part of this legislation before industrial action, whether it be by employees or employers, can occur. So, for instance, the requirement for conciliation um, that is being proposed by this legislation, so conciliation would be required before taking industrial action, and that's a good thing to see if things can be sorted out uh, between employers and their employees. Um, it's what the Commission should be doing. Um, so that new requirement being proposed by our government for conciliation before industrial action will reduce the likelihood of industrial action being taken and the requirement for 120 hours notice of industrial action will provide uh, employers and employees, depending on who is taking the industrial action, with adequate time to put in place contingencies. The bill also contains enhanced dispute resolution powers for the Fair Work Commission to settle disputes during bargaining, which can help to avoid industrial action. And of course, there's also the provision uh, that, requ that uh, requires arbitration. Uh, or, or opens the door to arbitration in the event of an intractable dispute. Um, we, we ultimately want to get a system that, where we reach agreement. Um, that's good for workers, it's good for businesses, it's good for the economy more generally. Um, so I'm not going to speculate about hypothetical situations that may or may not, may not under arise under the government's legislation, other than to point out um, that this legislation is putting in place additional safeguards um, to limit industrial action in the absence of conciliation. Senator Cash. Um, you just stated that one of the purposes or the objectives of the government is to reach agreement between the parties. 
Why then is the government allowing a situation that actually compels employers against their will into the single interest stream? Minister. Well, I know that Senator Cash doesn't accept that employees of a business have some rights here and have some say here. Um, she points to this folder of letters that she's received from employers, uh, which suggests to me that she hasn't bothered going and speaking to any employees about what they want out of an, employee, uh, an industrial relations system. And as I say, our, our government is taking a much more balanced approach, where we are listening to employers and we are listening to employees. And we think that it's fair um, that if a majority of workers in a particular workplace wish to be part of a multi-employer bargain um, and they can meet the various other tests that are set out in the legislation, um, that they have common interests with the other workplaces, that they are reasonably comparable to the other workplaces, then they should have a say on this as well. Senator Cash. Uh, thank you. And again, political commentary does not aid statutory interpretation. Um, the employees I've spoken to are just worried that they won't have a job, so they're very happy for me to ask the questions on behalf of their employer because they actually know their employer pays their wage. Um, can I go back to my line of questioning? Uh, can you guarantee that a multi-employer agreement in the single interest stream can't be used to capture employers in different states and territories? You've said that is a matter for the Fair Work Commission. I just need to understand, though, when we say different states and territories, can you just confirm, though, coast to coast is ruled out? Because I do have some people listening in who have asked me specifically uh, just to get that again from you, the guarantee. Minister. I have already answered that. Well, again, just Senator to clarify, Cash. because one minute is the first Fair Work Commission, the next is you are able to provide an answer. Employers in different states and territories, Fair Work Commission, I accept that. But I just need to understand coast to coast. Does that capture also the Fair Work Commission, or have we formally ruled that out, the West Coast to the East Coast? If we're formally ruled out, that's actually a good thing. I will give you that. That is actually a good thing. I just need that clarification. Minister. I refer, refer to my earlier answers. Can I just go to the public interest test now? Um, can you just take me through what the public interest test actually is? Minister. Sorry, Senator Cash, are you uh, talking about the um, single interest bargaining stream here? Yep. And excuse me, I presume you're asking uh, in relation to what will be subsection 2493, which is um, what sets out what um, talks about common interest. Yep. So it, it, and it says that um, a particular agreement must not be or authorisation must not be contrary to the public interest. Again, I think these are common sense decisions for the Fair Work Commission to make. There's, no, there's been no further. Uh, I don't think there's been any further uh, definition provided of that. Yep. Um, of course, um, as would be the case with any other statute the Commission will take into account the objects of the Act, um, but also I have been reminded that, uh, again in the revised explanatory memorandum on page 187 um, under clause 1074, uh, it states that, for example, when considering whether it would be contrary to the public interest to make the authorisation, the Fair Work Commission would have regard to the objects of the Act, as I just mentioned, such as whether making the variation will promote productivity and economic growth while being fair to working Australians, and the objects of parts two to four, um, such as whether approving the variation promotes collective bargaining in good faith, particularly at the enterprise level. Senator Cash. Thank you. And again, 
um, the Fair Work Commission obviously has um, a very large role there. Can I just go back to guaranteeing that the Public Interest Trust will prevent multi-employer strikes that shut down an entire port based on uh, what you've just outlined to the Senate? Sorry, Cash, I was just a bit distracted there. Would you mind just repeating that one? So just in terms of the public interest test, you've now um, put on the record uh, what some of the considerations are, but you also did say that it would be left to the Fair Work Commission in terms of when I first asked what the public interest is. I just need to understand, can you guarantee that the public interest test, and you've actually elaborated on it, will prevent and this is actually it's a very serious question being asked by um, an industry multi-employer strikes that shut down an entire port? Uh, as I've said, Senator Cash, I'm not going to be um, getting into hypothetical situations, but I can remind you that under the current legislation, uh, which we've inherited from your government, we very nearly um, had a an industry-wide strike, uh, sorry, industry-wide lockout um, of ports, effectively by Switzer, until the Fair Work Commission intervened. So, the very scare campaign that you seek to run about what may happen um, actually very nearly occurred under your own legislation. Senator Cash. Um, how many conciliation conferences occurred in the Switzer matter? Um, as you'd be aware, Senator Cash, uh, conciliation conferences are usually undertaken in private, so that's really a question that only the parties could answer and the Commission. Senator Cash. How many instances of industrial action occurred since the, enterprise, the Switzer Enterprise Agreement uh, came to an end in 2019 that were undertaken by uh, employees and the unions? Um, I think it's a matter of public record that there were multiple occasions of industrial action taken by employees of Switzer, um, and I'm aware, again from public debate, that that was in response to what they considered to be uh, an unreasonably unwilling approach from Switzer to bargain. And the Commission has recently um, uh, effectively ordered Switzer to get back to the bargaining table, which is a good thing. Senator Cash. Uh, can you confirm that there were more than 250 instances of protected industrial action by the Maritime Union of Australia after the 20th of October 2022? Minister. Well, I've already said that there were multiple uh, occasions of industrial action before the employer uh, attempted to lock out its entire workforce and shut down every port in Australia. Uh, Senator Pocock, is this, uh, are you okay, Senator Cash? With you? Is this on this line of argument? I can get, I'll give you the call, Senator Cash. Is. Okay, thank you. A question uh, for the minister um, about. Uh, the role of the uh, Fair Work Commission uh, with its new objects in relation to gender equality uh, and um, job security, in particular the, relation, the, the way in which can you, can you give us an indication about how 
the Fair Work Commission or whether you see it as part of its role to respond to a recommendation like this, which was made by the Select Committee on Work and Care in its interim report, and that is to develop an analysis of care work classifications and wage structures to systematically address underpayments and lift wages in the care sector. Such an analysis could consider the variability and value of work across the care sector uh, and establish the interrelationships across different care types, recognising and revaluing the value of care work. Uh, yes, thanks, sir. thanks, Senator um, uh, B. Pocock, um, and uh, that is uh, an important object for us uh, in this bill. Um, increased pay um, for uh, those feminised industries has been a significant focus, uh, and that will be something that um, we think will be addressed. We've obviously had a significant focus on. Uh, early childhood education and care, um, and uh, we think that this bill will help secure better pay for those workers in particular, so with a real focus on those uh, feminised industries. Um, and there has been some examples um, that we have used uh, to highlight why this legislation will be beneficial. Um, we talked about Jane, who's been an early childhood educator for 40 years. She works at the East Brunswick kindergarten and childcare. Um, incredibly passionate about her job, as many are in the early education space, um, but it's been a tough industry for her to dedicate her life to um, because of uh, the constant struggles with staffing. Um, and The low wages have been a significant factor uh, in this sector for a long period of time now. Um, Jane and her staff, along with workers in 70 other centres in Victoria, a benefit from being part of a multi-employer agreement. They've won wages 15 to 18 per cent above the award, and just as importantly, they won things like more time for planning and professional development, um, which at the end of the day, that's what delivers the better care for those children that are in, uh, the better quality care for children um, that they are providing the care for. Um, but the process that they have to go through to get there um, is currently draining in red tape, and it shouldn't be that hard. Um, directors in these centres are usually educators uh, as well, um, and they're not uh, workplace professionals or HR professionals. So we're removing the red tape so that people like Jane, and there'd be uh, thousands of Janes across the country, um, can do more of that essential work that they can do, um, but they can get the pay that they deserve at the same time. And I think the other thing that is important when you consider this legislation is that um, it's also an area, um, the early education sector, is one where we have a real skill shortage at the moment. Um, so obviously attracting people to those professions uh, is going to be easier um, if the pay is more adequate and deserving of the work that they do. Um, so we think that, that this bill will be a significant part of our uh, ability um, to deliver to ensure that those feminised industries are getting the appropriate pay, um, but also it will help us attract people um, to go work in those industries at the same time. So it does have a significant impact um, both on pay but also attracting people to work in that area uh, where there is significant skill shortages. Senator Pocock. Um, thank you for that answer. And that's obviously really important and reassuring in terms of the skill crises that are across that care sector. And there are, as you say, many thousands of Janes. We've certainly heard of many of them in the uh, work of the Select Committee on Work and Care. I wondered if you could comment further, though, not just about the childcare uh, classification structure, which is fairly truncated and doesn't really recognise the full gamut of skills of the childcare or early uh, childhood educators deploy, and how they relate to the similar skills in the disability sector and in the aged care sector. What we have is a plethora of job types that have never been properly revalued in relation to each other. We've got the aged care sector running ahead 
at a 15 per cent long overdue pay rise, but what would be the role specifically of the panel on, work, on care and community services? Um, would it be an appropriate role to consider the relativities across that really important and growing part of the economy and, and, and analyse what's appropriate relativities in the care economy broadly? Minister. Um, uh, thanks, uh, Senator um, B. Pocock, for the uh, question. Um, and uh, we have set up two um, panels um, that will be uh, responsible for looking at the specific areas that you mentioned. Um, one uh, is in regards to pay equity, and the other is in regards to into um, care and community. Uh, into the care and community sector. Um, so I, I do note um, the work that that committee um, did, and I think that um, it was um, quite a decent effort to do that committee in the short time frame that you did. Um, not all Senate committees uh, work as efficiently as that one, um, and that's uh, a particularly good effort for someone who is relatively new to the Senate at the same time. Um, so uh, we see that as being uh, a significant part of uh, what we do, obviously, we went to the election with saying that we want people to get a wage increase. Um, we know that people have been struggling, but it again comes back to that point I made before about attracting people to these industries uh, is really tough while the wages are low. Um, I spend a significant amount of my time uh, in regional Australia and particularly regional Queensland, and I know how hard it is to attract people to work in some of these industries, um, whether it be aged care, whether it be um, providing services um, through the NDIS. And there's not the market in a lot of these places that there are in the capital cities. So attracting people to this workforce, um, ensuring they've got the training uh, that they need um, to uh, be able to work in this area. Um, but also ensuring that they're getting paid adequately um, so that it can, one, attract people so that they do see a career for themselves in this industry, um, but two, so that once we do attract them, um, they become long-term employees. So uh, it is something that we think uh, is dealt with as part of this bill, uh, and it's something that uh, this government is absolutely passionate about delivering on. Uh, one, because we want to see people paid better, but two, we understand how important these community services are, uh, whether it be in the NDIS, uh, whether it be in aged care, uh, whether it be in other uh, parts of the care economy. Uh, we know how important those workers are uh, to the community, and uh, we think that they will greatly benefit from uh, the parts of this bill that apply. Senator Pocock. Thank you for that answer. I wanted to ask a couple of questions about the minimum wage. The, one of the new objects of the Act is to uh, improve gender equality, and one of the fastest ways to do that is to lift the minimum wage. Um, I wondered um, uh, whether the government had considered uh, any of uh, in, in, innovations or changes in relation to the minimum wage. And just foreshadow, we're going to move uh, an amendment uh, to the bill, uh, mirroring a development in many other countries, which is to lift the minimum wage to reach 60 per cent of median earnings. It's a quick route to, lowering, to narrowing gender pay equity, and it links the minimum wage to the, the average shift in wages across the country. Uh, so that uh, it, it will narrow inequality more broadly. I'm just wondering, did the government consider uh, the kinds of things we are seeing across Europe now, where they have adopted now a European directive around lifting minimum wage to 60 per cent of median earnings? Minister. Uh, thanks, Chair. Uh, and again, thanks to um, Senator um, B. Pocock for the question. Um, it is important issues you raise, and it was something that uh, was also a factor uh, or a discussion point at the Jobs and Skills Summit that I think you might have been a participant at at the same time. Um, what we committed to doing or reviewing 
um, at the Jobs and Skills Summit was a review into the living wage, uh, and our commitment was to initiate a detailed consultation and research process on the concept of the living wage, uh, reporting back in late uh, 2023. Um, that is something that we are still committed to. Um, obviously, uh, it is a significant issue, and I think that the uh, gender equity parts, um, will, you know, our commitment um, to gender equity that runs at the same time is obviously important. Um, and I think for the government, the fundamental premise of this bill is that it's designed to lift wages for Australian workers, and particularly those who are our lowest paid workers at the same time. So um, we feel as though um, the commitments we made uh, in the lead up and during the election campaign, uh, and have obviously been um, committed to subsequently, and we've obviously taken action around that in supporting an increase um, in the minimum wage as one of our first acts uh, in government. Um, I think the Australian people know uh, where we land on these things, and I think that this legislation uh, is an important commitment, um, but we also know and acknowledge um, that there is ongoing work and it doesn't end um, with the hopeful passage of this legislation uh, in the uh, next day or so. Senator Pocock. Thanks for that answer. Um, uh, we'll be watching that process, of course, unfold with great interest. Um, I wondered if you could also give me a response, Minister, to um, another issue that we are raising we plan to raise in amending this bill, and that's in relation to requesting flexibility. The, the British, the UK in, industrial law, has for some time had a right to request flexibility, beginning with just parents uh, and families. Um, <coughs> you could request flexibility in the UK um, if you had family responsibilities, but they re reviewed the way that law was working and have now moved to expand the right to request flexibility so it's available to all workers. You don't have to be looking after a child. You may have a friend you want to care for. You may have a range of other reasons that make you seek flexibility. And I wonder whether the government had considered um, learning or building on the lessons of other countries in, and, and widening eligibility. The, the great value of it in particular for men is that it removes the stigma uh, of putting your hand up and asking for flexibility, and that has a lot of dividends on the home front in terms of redistributing care and domestic work. Minister. Uh, thanks, Acting Deputy President, and thanks, Senator Pocock, and thanks, Senator Chisholm, for relieving me there for a little bit. Um, Senator Pocock, uh, we, we certainly support the intentions um, of what you're saying here, and, and I think you are proposing to move an amendment uh, along these lines as well. Uh, as we've said, promoting gender equality is at the heart of our bill, and that's why gender equality will be included as an object of the Fair Work Act. Our bill also extends the right to request flexible work to pregnant employees, which does not exist under the current Fair Work Act. Uh, our bill gives employees somewhere to go if their boss says no um, to their request. Um, we do recognise, though, that it's important to balance the need for an employer to run their business while enhancing the rights for those employees who do rely on flexible work arrangements. And we feel that at the current time, uh, where we've landed on this point is, is the right place to land. Senator Pocock. Thank you. And um, you will know, Minister, that I'm an, an enthusiast for uh, the backing up of the right to request flexibility, and I, I really appreciate that direction in the bill. And of course, we've talked a lot about that. Um, I wanted to ask you about uh, unpaid parental leave <clears throat> and the fact that the, um, if the bill proceeds and the right enforcement is introduced in relation to requesting flexibility, uh, the remaining uh, national employment standard, which won't have backup, will be un the requesting of an extension of unpaid parental leave, and we will be moving an amendment in that direction also. Um, what I wondered if you wanted to foreshadow your response to that, whether it is time to make sure that all of the 11 national employment standards have backup um, without leaving you know, the, the one or two that are of particular relevance to women uh, without a proper enforcement mechanism. Minister. Uh, thanks, Senator Pocock. We will, the government will be supporting that amendment. Um, as you say, it includes a procedure for dealing with disputes 
arising from a request to extend unpaid parental leave period modelled on the dispute resolution procedure for requests for flexible working arrangements. Um, as you would no doubt be aware, Senator Pocock, there are only two entitlements in the national employment standards that are currently an unenforceable, the right to request a flexible working arrangement and the right to request an, an extension of unpaid parental leave, and these entitlements are predominantly used by women. Our bill was already providing dispute resolution for one of those entitlements, being flexible, flexible work. We support this amendment to also provide dispute resolution for the right to request unpaid parental leave as well. Senator Pocock. Yes. Great news. Thank you very much for that answer. Thank you. Uh, Senator Cash. Thank you. Uh, ju just building on um, the line of questioning that Senator Pocock uh, has raised, um, the government has said, and Senator Watt, um, you weren't here when um, questions were being put to Senator Chisholm, um, but the government has said on numerous occasions that this legislation is all about getting wages moving and ensuring that Australians get a pay rise, and Senator Chisholm uh, did confirm that. Uh, in fact, in the overview of the bill, uh, in the explanatory memorandum, it states the bill would amend the Fair Work Act 2009 and related legislation to get wages moving, boost job security, tackle gender inequity and restore fairness and integrity uh, to fair work institutions. So just building on the comments that Senator Chisholm made, um, and he stated uh, in response to a line of questioning from Senator Pocock on uh, the increase in wages. Uh, that this bill uh, will result in. He said the Australian people know where we land on these things. So could I just ask you to elaborate a little further? When does the government expect wages to start increasing as a result of the legislation? Minister. Um, of course, I'm not going to give a precise date on which we can expect to see wages get moving uh, in this country, uh, but what I can say is that obviously there are a range of agreements uh, that already exist between employees and employers, uh, and those agreements will have to see their course before uh, workers in those particular businesses may see some benefit from this legislation. Um, there are also grace periods provided uh, through the legislation around the bargaining process. Um, but what I can say is that um, I can guarantee you that if we leave the workplace relations laws in the way they currently are, without amendment, I can guarantee you we will get exactly the same result as we've seen for the last 10 years, which is stagnant wages, low productivity, and it's in no one's interest to continue that. And it seems that the coalition are the only group who think that that's a satisfactory way to go. And I guess that's because they think that low wages are a deliberate design feature of their economy. Um, but I can guarantee you that if we do nothing to change the system, we will get the same result. Uh, and that's why we're confident, again, based on international evidence, that some of the changes that we're proposing here will deliver better wage outcomes, better productivity for employers. Uh, and that's what underpins our commitment to making these changes. Senator Cash. Thank you. So we don't have a precise date. Um, but you do say, as I said in the explanatory memorandum, it states the bill would amend the Fair Work Act 2009 and related legislation to get wages moving. So if you could just take us through then uh, what modelling was undertaken in relation to being able to make that statement in the explanatory memorandum. Minister. Uh, it's, I'm having a sense of deja vu, Senator Cash, because I feel that you asked me that question at estimates. Um, and I guess I'll give you the same answer that I gave you at estimates, which is that there is no modelling um, uh, on that point. But what there is is a very extensive body of international evidence that demonstrates uh, that the kind of bargaining system that we are proposing in these laws delivers better wage outcomes for workers, better productivity for employers, uh, and by virtue of that, uh, a, a good return for the economy. Um, so I feel very confident pursuing these uh, laws on the basis of that international evidence. Senator Cash. Uh, so you've confirmed that no modelling was undertaken in relation to the part of the explanatory memorandum that states 
uh, the bill would amend the Fair Work Act and related legislation to get wages moving. We don't have a precise date uh, or time frame in relation to when the government expects wages uh, to start moving. Um, do you, or can you at least advise by how much do you expect wages to start moving as a result of this legislation, given, given it clearly states in the explanatory yeah. memorandum and related to, to get wages moving? Minister. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Um, again, I think I answered this question at estimates, uh, Senator Cash, but um, there's no one in the country that could give a categorical answer on that because, of course, every agreement that is struck is different. Um, there will be some agreements that are struck under this legislation that provide for higher pay rises than others. Um, there will be some agreements that are struck that provide for a range of different conditions, some better than others. That's how the system works. Um, but what I can tell you is that you know, things like inserting job security and gender equality as objects of the Fair Work Act um, will provide for a fairer system of, uh, at, at work and pay rises. Things like banning job ads that pay less than the minimum wage uh, will help lift wages. Things like sunsetting the zombie agreements that we still see in place that arose under your government's work choices legislation, that will help get wages moving again. So there are any number of uh, actions being taken through this legislation which will get wages moving again, and that's something that the Australian people voted for at the last election. Senator the Cash. Um, how many Australians will see their wages increase as a result of this legislation? Minister. Well, again, you wouldn't expect me to be able to provide that kind of answer, and that's why you've asked the question. Um, the, it's, it's, it is interesting, though. It's interesting, though, um, that having spent weeks uh, and months uh, running around the country, scaring employers and perhaps some employees about the, the risk of a wages breakout, we now have a series of questions from the opposition which seem to imply that workers won't receive a pay rise. So I guess the opposition at some point has got to make up its mind. Um, what is the right scare campaign? Is it going to be a continuation of scare campaigns um, that wages are going to be out of control, or are we going to pursue a different kind of scare campaign, which is that workers might not receive the wages that they think about they, they might get? So perhaps some consistency from the opposition would be kind of helpful on this front. Senator the Cash. Um, Organisations such as uh, the Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry, uh, the Business Council of Australia and the Australian Industry Group uh, have all said that this bill won't see an increase in wages because less agreements will be made between the parties themselves uh, and terms and conditions will instead uh, be determined by the Fair Work Commission by way of compulsory arbitration. Uh, this is because it will be virtually impossible for multiple employers to come to a common position and then agree with multiple unions, um, that is to say the more parties involved, the less likely they will agree, uh, increasing the risk that the matter will be decided by compulsory arbitration. Um, if more and more agreements are decided by the Commission, and we've, we've heard tonight there's a lot being decided by the Commission, um, we'll leave it to the Fair Work Commission. That's a decision for the Fair Work Commission. The Fair Work Commission will make that decision. Um, if more and more agreements are decided by the Commission by compulsory arbitration and less agreements are reached between the parties themselves, despite the fact that we actually began with uh, quotes from the Minister in relation to the primacy of enterprise level agreements, um, will the government concede that the provisions are not operating as intended? Minister. Um, thanks, Senator Cash. Well, as you would know, the way the legislation is drafted provides for arbitration as a last resort. So I don't think that it's reasonable to assume that the majority of negotiations are going to result in arbitration. As I've said earlier in this debate, and as Minister Burke has said repeatedly, we want to see a system where employers and employees reach agreement. Uh, and there are multiple streams uh, being provided for that to occur. Um, it's our intention to drive up the level of agreements. And let's not forget that, um, generally speaking, uh, workers who are covered by enterprise agreements 
uh, end up with better pay rises than those and better conditions and better pay in general than those on the award. Um, so it'll be a good thing if we can see more agreements struck because that means that more workers will get pay rises, they'll have money to put into the local economy, uh, and you, you know what? Employers will get better productivity out of it as well. Mm. So cash. Um, if I could just go back to uh, the questions uh, that we were asking in relation to, in particular, um, multi-employer agreements in the single interest stream and the public interest test. And I know that you had to step out and Senator Chisholm came in and we undertook a different line of questioning. Um, but can I just go back to, um, can you guarantee that the public interest test will prevent targeted efforts to pressure an employer by coordinating industrial action against its suppliers or customers who are also part of the same multi-employer agreement? Minister. Um, as, I, as I said earlier in the, no in the night, Senator Cash, um, our legislation actually um, imposes additional safeguards uh, that, uh, against uh, the taking of uh, unjustified industrial action. Conciliation needs to occur. Um, there's the arbitration for intractable disputes. Um, so any suggestion that this is going to lead to um, industrial mayhem and strikes of the kind that you're talking about is merely designed to scare people about things that are not provided for by this legislation. Okay. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Minister. You look like you need a break, so I'll give you a break from your legal jousting and setting up uh, definitions of terms for the future. In proposing this bill, the government says the, the bill aims to secure jobs. My amendment on sheet 1768 goes to the heart of ensuring job security and protecting workers' rights. To ensure job security, my amendment on sheet 1768 ensures that unjustified vaccine discrimination is stamped out in employment. The original bill inserts breastfeeding, intersex status and gender identity as attributes that the Fair Work Act protects from discrimination. This amendment copies that approach and simply adds COVID-19 vaccination as an attribute protected from discrimination. The protection is still subject to the limits imposed on the other discrimination grounds in the Fair Work Act. An employer will not be in breach of the anti-discrimination grounds where the employer can prove, as they should have to, that it is a genuine and reasonable requirement of the position. This amendment is reasonable. In its approach, it is not radical because it uses and simply extends the existing mechanisms in the Fair Work Act. We've long known that COVID vaccines do not stop transmission. Before this became apparent, however, getting vaccinated to, quote, protect others was the justification many businesses used to roll out vaccine mandates. As a condition of keeping their job, many employees were coerced and still are being coerced, still being coerced into receiving COVID injections and boosters. They do not want. These vaccine mandates cannot be justified given the fact the vaccines do not guarantee protection from transmission. The New South Wales Personal Injury Commission agrees with this view, with workers' compensation being awarded for psychological distress, psychological distress stemming from mandates in the determination of Dorking and the Secretary of the Department of Education handed down on the 3rd of November. Sometimes the wheels of justice turn slowly Yet we are happy that judicial bodies are taking up this self-evident position that broad vaccination mandates cannot be justified. Despite this, mandates are still in effect across some of the private sector, much of the private sector. It's clear that further legislative action must be taken. Businesses are simply ignoring the evidence against unjustified vaccine mandates. A clear message needs to be sent that unreasonable directions that infringe on workers' rights have no place in Australian workplaces. Often, mandates do not even account for Australians that have accepted medical contraindications to vaccination. The Australian newspaper reports that Qantas sacked a pilot for failing to comply with a vaccination mandate while he was off work in a serious condition, 
health condition being treated for bowel cancer. Separately, I've met a Qantas employee who, after being injected with the first COVID injection, was rushed to hospital with severe disability, possibly life-threatening due to the COVID injection. After hospital care and partial recovery, he returned to work where Qantas insisted he get the second injection. He contested it and is on a vastly reduced pay on workers' compensation. He fears his career with Qantas is finished. How can this be in this country? This amendment seeks to reinforce workers' rights to refuse a workplace direction where it is not a reasonable and justified requirement of the job. It leaves no doubt for employees and employers that vaccine mandates must not be in place unless there is a reasonable and justifiable need for them. Minister, given that businesses continue to ignore workers' rights in this area, will the government support this amendment to reinforce the decisions of the Fair Work Commission and codify protections for workers against unreasonable workplace directions? Senator Roberts, before I call the minister, I just need some assistance from the chamber here because we've managed to jump uh, a number of um, uh, amendments, but uh, to, to get to yours on sheet 1768. But I've uh, questioned before me at the moment and the chamber to deal with government amendments 1268 on P uh, PV 124. Senator Roberts? Yes, uh, Chair, I'm asking a question. I'm not moving my mo amendment. Just, but, but to help me out, Senator Roberts, and, um, and I know we're in for a long haul, um, you have to be relevant to the amendments that I've got in front of me at the moment. So how can you make your questions relevant while I'm still, still trying to deal with government amendments on um, PV124? Well, it goes to the, the heart of the bill, which is where the, the current discussion has been going, into the security and the pay rates of, of the two justifications that the government is making for this legislation, supposedly. Okay, and it goes to that job security. Senator Roberts, I, I don't need any help, thank you very much, anyway, yet. And if I do, I'll call upon the clerk. Um, I will seek guidance from the clerk because I'm just a little bit confused at the moment, Senator Roberts. Maybe it's the late hour, but I'll be back to you in a second. That's right. Senator Roberts, um, and you and I are mates, but I'm going to stretch the friendship here and test it. Uh, you have to be relevant to the question of the government amendments in front of me. Now, I'm happy to put the government amendments and take the vote on it now. So what I will do, what I will do, um, and uh, I'm not making this up, Senator Roberts, I'm surrounded by some very intelligent, helpful people up here, but I will put the question. A lot more questions. Senator Cash. Senator Cash, I was just going to read and I didn't see you jump, but Thanks. Senator Cash. Um, can I go back to the questions then in relation to uh, the multi employer agreement in the single interest stream? Uh, we were talking about the common interest. Uh, and in terms of the common interest, uh, can you guarantee the two mining companies won't be found to have a common interest? just because they both undertake mining? Minister. Uh, thanks, Deputy President, and thanks, Senator Roberts, for giving me a break, as you, uh, as you suggested. Maybe there will be a time later where we can answer your questions. Um, Senator Cash, uh, as, as I've said already, um, the requirements that would need to be met for um, different employers, whether they be in the mining industry or any other industry, um, to be brought together under a multi-employer agreement through the single interest bargaining stream are that they have clearly identifiable, clearly identifiable common interests and that agreement must not be contrary to the public interest. Um, now, We've already talked about the fact that there are different factors uh, which may be relevant um, to the Commission in determining whether the employers have a common interest. 
uh, and they include geographical location, the regulatory regime and the nature of the enterprises. So, again, it's a matter for the Commission to make a decision on any particular case. So Senator Cash. Matter for the Commission. Thank you very much. Um, is it enough that two employers are in the same area and pay under the same award? Minister. Uh, well, the legislation. Uh, I should have. Sorry, just before I answer that question, I should have also pointed out that, in addition to that common interest test, the the case involving mining companies that you are talking about um, would, as with any other case, also have to demonstrate that the uh, operations and business activities of the different employers are reasonably comparable, as well as being meeting that common interest test. But in answer to your question about um, different businesses paying under the same award, or paying on the basis of the same award, the, um, the, the bill provides that one of the matters that may be relevant um, to determining whether the employers have a common interest uh, is the terms and conditions of employment in those enterprises. So that is one factor that could be considered, but again, it's ultimately a decision for the Commission. And, and as I say, there's nothing unusual in industrial relations legislation about leaving matters uh, for the Commission to use its discretion. Senator Cash. I beg to differ in terms of it actually is unusual unless it is a deliberate attempt to actually centralise decision making with the Fair Work Commission and actually, despite our original line of questioning, where I understood the government really still wanted the primacy to be agreements at an enterprise level, every single answer to date is a centralised answer. Um, could a small trucking company, and again, we are in the single uh, interest stream, so it is 21 and above, just so I don't get taken through the 20 and below again, could a small trucking company have a common interest with a large rail company, or can you actually rule that one out? Minister. I'm not a commissioner. I'm not going to prejudge what the commission— uh, no, yeah, really, I'm not a commissioner. Yeah, really, I'm not a commissioner. Um, so uh, this is a matter for the, the, the commission to exercise its jurisdiction in, and it, it sounds from the comments from the opposition that they don't have confidence in the commission, which frankly surprises me, um, Order. given recent appointments. Um, but uh, the commission will have be, give consideration to a number of factors, um, and they're clearly set out in the bill. Senator Cash. Could a civil construction firm and a mining company have a common interest because they undertake some work at the same work site? Uh, well, Minister, sorry. sorry, Acting Deputy President. Um, well, civil construction is exempted from uh, multi enterprise bargaining under the bill. So I guess the answer to that question is no. Senator Cash. Would a construction firm and a mining company have a common interest because they undertake some work at the same site? Minister. Um, so the amendments uh, that we're moving to the bill um, provide that work in the civil construction sector is to be considered general building and construction work, which means that work in that sector would not be subject to multi-enterprise bargaining. Senator Cash. Um, what is the government's rationale then for excluding certain parts of the building and construction industry from parts of the new bargaining stream? Minister. Under the bill, the Fair Work Commission must not approve multi-employer, sorry, multi-enterprise agreements that cover employees in relation to general building and construction work. Multi-enterprise agreements are not necessary or appropriate for the general building and construction industry. 
The scope of the work that has been excluded has been carefully defined to ensure that the exclusion is appropriately limited. Following government amendments in the Senate, general building and construction work will include work in the civil construction industry. As with general building and construction work, multi-employer agreements are not necessary or appropriate for the civil construction industry. Senator Cash. And again, can you just take me through, though, what is the government's rationale for undertaking this action? Minister. Minister. Um, thanks, Acting Deputy President. The, the construction industry is actually the heaviest user of the single enterprise enterprise bargaining system at the moment. Um, so they, that industry has demonstrated that they can make single enterprise agreements. Uh, employees and businesses in this sector already have the opportunity to engage in enterprise bargaining. Um, so on the basis of um, the experience in the industry being a heavy user of the single enterprise bargaining system, um, the government's view is that there's no need uh, to um, open multi-employer bargaining up for this industry. Senator Cash. Can I just confirm again, just for the Hansard record, that the exclusion for general building work as defined means that workers in the construction industry will then not enjoy the same bargaining rights as workers in all other sectors in the event that they're not employed under an enterprise agreement? Minister. Well, all I can do is, is repeat that um, the, the multi-enterprise bargaining will not be available um, for work in the civil construction sector, which is considered to be general building and construction work. And as I say, um, the rationale for that is that that industry are extremely heavy users of single enterprise bargaining, um, and we have seen no evidence uh, to suggest that that should change. Senator Cash. Uh, when you say the civil construction sector, um, is there anything not included? Like, has and I haven't looked at the amendment properly yet. Have you actually excluded anything from that definition? Minister. Um, there are a couple of forms of what people might regard as construction work um, that are uh, exempted from the exemption um, so that they would be able to make use of multi-employer bargaining. Um, and uh, You may not have heard me say at the outset, Senator Cash, that one of the amendments that um, we are moving uh, following the negotiations with Senator David Pocock is that the asphalt industry is not considered to be general building and construction work. Um, and also there's an amendment which I didn't mention earlier, uh, which is uh, work um, that is the construction, repair, maintenance or demolition of powerhouses or other structures that use eligible renewable energy sources to generate electricity. Um, so uh, businesses and, em and employees in those two industries, renewables and asphalt would be able to access multi-employer bargaining, provided they met all the other relevant tests. Senator Cash. So just to confirm, there are some exemptions from the exemptions, which means they're in, as you've just confirmed. Can I just get you to just take me to what amendments they are um, so we can have a look at them and we'll come back tomorrow with a further line of questioning? Minister. Sorry, was there a question in there? What, what, what are the sections so, that we can go and have a look at, please? Uh, so item, item 61 of the amendment sheet, and I uh, got one detail wrong there. I understand that the amendment, the amendment in relation to renewables, is as a result of the discussions with Senator Pocock. Um, the amendment in relation to asphalt uh, is not, and that's because I think any reasonable person would think that. Uh, would not consider that work in the asphalt industry um, amounts to general building and construction work. 
Senator Cash. So the amendment that you're moving is slightly different to what the, how the original bill was drafted, is my understanding. Yep, that would be the minister. That would be fair to assume, because they're new amendments. So Senator Cash. Can I just then confirm, um, having not had the benefit of being properly able to analyse the amendments because they were literally tabled as we were in this debate? Would this mean if your employee was employed in a construction business to install air conditioning ducts in commercial building and construction, would the employee fall under the excluded work? Minister. Um, thanks, uh, Senator Cash. Uh, the in the original bill itself, um, in what would be clause 651 capital B, um, which adds a new section 23 capital B, um, it, it actually sets out um, a num what, what is not considered to be general building and construction work. And one of the examples that's given is work in connection with the installation, major modernisation, servicing, repair or maintenance of lifts and escalators or air conditioning or ventilation. So um, that work in relation to um, installation, major modernisation, servicing, repair or maintenance of, I think you said air conditioning or ventilation, um, is not considered to be general building and construction work and therefore could be the subject of multi-employer bargaining if the employers and employees chose to do so and if a part that passed the other tests. Senator Cash. So I just confirm. So the answer is yes. Would this mean if your employee was employed in a construction business to install air conditioning ducts in commercial building construction, would the employee fall under this excluded work clause? The answer is no, they're actually in. You also just said, though, that if the employer and the employee agreed to enter into, are you saying the employer in this particular circumstance cannot be compelled? Minister. Well, no, I was talking colloquially and saying that the, um, uh, all the, if all the usual tests were met, uh, and I'm reminded uh, that there is a, an association, um, the exact name of it I've forgotten, but it's essentially air conditioning and maintenance um, Mr. Is it Scavera, I think his name is, um, who has been in the media uh, speaking on behalf of businesses involved in this industry, who has said that he and his members are very much looking forward to taking part in, um, uh, well, that's nine employers. I, I didn't know that we were being selective about which employers we, we thought were the right ones and the wrong ones. Um, his members are very enthusiastic about taking part in multi-employer bargaining and the reason he gave was that he, was, he and his members were sick of seeing rogue operators in the industry trying to undercut people through a race to the bottom for wages. So good on Mr Scavera, good on his members uh, for wanting to do the right thing by their workers and wanting to do the, do the right thing by their members, and we want to see more of it. Mm -hmm. Senator Cash. Um, just going back to um, the government's rationale for excluding certain parts of the building and construction industry. And uh, one of the reasons, in fact, is, would appear to be the prime reason that the government has undertaken this exclusion is, as you said, um, they are a high proportion, that, that the, the, their use of enterprise agreements um, is very, very high. Uh, my understanding is, though, the mining sector in particular on the East Coast is also a significant user of single enterprise agreements. Um, was the government approached in any way by any of the mining companies um, to actually also have an exclusion on the basis that uh, they already have a high proportion of enterprise agreements and uh, consistent with the government's rationale in terms of excluding uh, certain parts of the building and construction industry? Minister. Um, I, th I think it's pretty clear that uh, representatives of the mining industry did make representations, and again, I think it's been in the media that they're not particularly happy about uh, potentially being part of multi-employer bargaining. bargaining. 
Um, but uh, you know, if again, if the, if those particular companies have a history of reaching single enterprise bargaining agreements, I don't see any reason why they'd change course. Senator Cash doesn't actually answer the question. The rationale you stated in relation to the exclusion that you have provided of certain parts of the building and construction industry is based on the high proportion of enterprise agreements. The mining industry would argue they also have a high proportion of enterprise agreements. So again, I ask you, um, why weren't they excluded? Minister. Uh, again, I, I can't really add anything to what I've said, um, but um, if mining companies want to continue uh, with their practice of single enterprise bargaining agreements and if their workforce are content to go down that path, then I expect that will continue. Senator Cash. Uh, in relation to the rationale that the, high proportion, the use of uh, the high proportion of enterprise agreements utilised by uh, the excluded parts of the building and construction industry. Um, what was therefore the government's threshold uh, in determining that you would exclude certain parts of the building and construction industry? Minister. Well, it's a bit like the discussion we were having about metrics before. I don't think anyone set a metric for you know what percentage of uh, agreements in a particular sector needed to be met in order for them to take part or not take part in multi-employer agreements, just as it, there was no metric um, that needs to be met to determine whether something is in the geographical location, same geographical location. Um, these are matters of judgment, and uh, our judgment was that, um, the, um, that the practice in the construction industry was well set, wasn't, didn't need multi-employer bargaining, uh, and as I say, if mining companies want to continue their practice of single enterprise bargaining and their workforce agrees, then I expect they'll continue with it. Senator Cash. Uh, both Rio Tinto and BHP, in particular in Western Australia, uh, have spoken out uh, against being included uh, in relation to the multi-employer bargaining single interest stream. Um, did the Premier of Western Australia provide any representations to the Albanese government on behalf of Rio Tinto and BHP. Minister. Not that I'm aware of. Uh, Senator Cash. Uh, what safeguards in the bill would prevent a multi-employer agreement growing to cover a whole industry or most of an industry or even cross multiple industries, um, does the bill limit the number of businesses that can be part of an agreement? Minister. Um, there's, if, if your question is whether there's a numerical limit on the number of businesses that can be part of a multi-employer enterprise? The answer is no. Uh, of course, each of those businesses would need to pass the relevant tests, um, uh, but no, there's no numerical limit. Senator Cash. Just reverting to the first part of my question, uh, so what safeguards in the bill would prevent a multi-employer agreement growing to cover a whole industry or most of an industry or even cross multiple industries? Minister. Minister. Um, well, the, uh, the safeguards, as you put it, are that uh, each of the businesses who, um, or, or if a business is to um, become part of a multi-employer agreement, then all of those tests would need to be met. And as I say, um, to take one example around the geographical location, 
uh, it's hard to imagine that the Commission exercising its discretion would uh, include every single business in every single industry in the entire country. Um, but, uh, so I, I think that there are adequate safeguards in there for businesses who are concerned about that. And the bottom line is that um, any such bargain would need to be considered to be in the public interest by the Commission. Senator Cash. And thank you for that. Ultimately, it is a matter for the Fair Work Commission. And you haven't ruled out, or you said, does the bill limit the number of businesses that can be part of agreement? The answer is no. Uh, just in terms of going back to one the. Minute, just one go. Sir, uh, minute. Uh, that, that was your evidence. That was just writing well, it down. The, well, the, the, what my, my evidence was actually that um, uh, for businesses to be part of a multi employer bargain, um, it may well be that in one geographical location, there are a large number of businesses. Well, it may be well be that there are a large number of businesses in one geographical location that are subject to the same regulatory regime, um, that have the same terms and conditions of employment in those enterprises, uh, and therefore, and are reasonably comparable, and therefore meet the tests to be part of a multi-employer bargain. Um, but um, to suggest that that will mean that every corner store in the country. Um, of varying sizes selling different products, pizza stores, retail stores, hamburger stores, whatever kind of stores are going to be a part of the same multi-employer agreement, um, I think is exaggerating because it would ignore the various tests that are put in place in the legislation. Senator Cash. Can I just go back to then, does the bill limit the number of businesses that can be part of an agreement in a numerical sense? Was your answer no? Minister. Yes, my answer was no. Senator Cash. If I could just return to um, the rationale in relation to the carve-out of civil construction from, I understand, all streams of multi-employer um, bargaining. Um, the agreement that you have with Senator Pocock, is it to include a complete carve-out? Minister. Well, um, I'll, I'm sure I'll be corrected if I'm wrong, but the, the bill that we introduced prior to the negotiations uh, with Senator Pocock being finalised already carved out, to use your words, uh, civil construction work, sorry, commercial construction work, um, and that was defined to be general building and construction work in the original bill. Uh, and what's resulted, and that of course had the various exemptions to the exemptions that we were talking about before, uh, and what's changed as a result of the negotiations with Senator Pocock is that there's an additional form of what might be regarded as construction work being work to do with renewable energy um, that is also now exempted from the exemption. Senator Cash. Sorry, Minister. That advice. Sorry, just to, just to clarify, as a result of the negotiations with Senator Pocock, the, um, the category of work that was excluded from multi-employer bargaining was expanded from being commercial construction work to civil and construction commercial work. And through the course of those negotiations, um, it was agreed that uh, civil Sorry, that construction work in relation to renewable energy uh, would not uh, be part of the exemption and therefore could be subject to multi employer bargaining. Right. Senator Cash. Could I just now turn to the competition effects of this bill? 
Did the department consider or the government the competition effects of the bill? Minister. Minister. Um, this, I know this issue about um, the application of co uh, competition laws has come up a bit um, and again has been um, uh, used by some to create concern in the broader community, but uh, industrial laws are not part of not subject to competition. Yeah, uh, have, have always been or for some time now have been exempted from competition laws. Um, so I don't think that the concerns that have been raised in this regard um, are valid. Senator Cash. So, industrial laws as they stand today, under the unamended Fair Work Act, are, yes, you are right, exempt from competition law. The bill that we are currently debating has some of the most fundamental changes to the industrial relations system that this parliament has seen in decades. You are opening up a new stream of multi-employer bargaining. In relation to the common interest test, the public interest test, the comparability test, you have advised the Senate it is on record for statutory interpretation purposes, and I quote, mm -hmm. that will be left to the discretion of the Fair Work Commission. You have refused to rule out scenario after scenario after scenario. Employers in different states and territories, employers across different industries, big businesses and small businesses, marginal businesses and profitable industries. Industries. You have said to me directly, does the bill limit the number of businesses that can be part of an agreement? The answer was no. So when this bill passes, we will be talking about a fundamentally different mm. state of affairs. And you are right. The impacts on competition have been raised time and time again in the incredibly short time that employers and employees across this country have been having in relation to understanding the impact of this legislation. So given that you admit that this issue has been raised, hasn't been raised in relation to the current regime. It has been raised in relation to the fundamental changes that are now occurring. Did the department consider competition effects of this bill? And if not, why not? Minister. Um, yes, the department did consider this uh, in, in drafting this legislation. And what it also considered was the long-standing exemption of industrial relations laws as they relate to terms and conditions of employment from competition laws. Uh, and in fact, uh, the former commissioner of the ACCC, Rod Sims, has only today uh, made the public statements that uh, workplace relations laws, um, particularly in relation to the terms and conditions of employment, have been exempt from competition laws since 1965 uh, for good social policy reasons, and nothing has changed as a result of this legislation. Senator Cash. Was the bill run through Treasury to ensure that when the changes are made into law, it will not create problems with the Competition and Consumer Act or other adverse consequences? Minister. Um, Treasury, along with a range of other departments within the federal government, was consulted about the drafting of the bill. So, uh, yeah, that's probably best leave it at that. Uh, okay. so they were cash. consulted. Were they specifically consulted in relation to the impact on or potential impact on the Competition and Consumer Act or other adverse consequences? Uh, Minister. They were consulted on the entire bill. So 
in relation Senator. to um, the C Competition and Consumer Act and the competition effects of the bill, um, what was Treasury's response? Minister. Well, I think, Senator Cash, you know from being a minister that it's, you wouldn't, um, in this sort of debate, um, provide information about advice that one department has provided to another, and I don't propose to do so either. Senator Cash. Uh, without then providing me the advice, were Treasury asked specifically in relation to the impact on competition and uh, whether or not problems would be created within the Competition and Consumer Act, uh, based on the fact that you have stated uh, that this has been raised with the government? Mm. Minister. Um, well, again, uh, Treasury was consulted about the entire Act. Um, every provision in it was put to Treasury for their views, uh, and, and they provided the feedback that they provided. Um, and I mean, I know that. I mean, what, what we're trying to get to in this country is a workplace relations system where we see competition among businesses on innovation, on the quality of their product, on the quality of the service that they op offer to their customers, not competition based on undercutting each other's wages. Um, that's what we're trying to achieve here. Um, I'm trying to find the relevant section of the competition and consumer um, law as well. So the Com Competition and Consumer Act uh, of Australia 2010 actually provides an exemption from the application of competition laws. and uh, it, in determining whether certain anti-competitive behaviour has occurred, the Act actually says that regard shall not be had to any act done or concerted practice to the extent that it relates to the remuneration, conditions of employment, hours of work or working conditions of employees. So any act undertaken in accordance with any law, such as this law, which relates to, for instance, um, the remuneration, conditions of employment, hours of work or working conditions of employees is exempt from uh, competition law under the very act that sets out the competition law of, the, of Australia. So any attempts that are being made um, to wind up employers that they might be subject to action from the ACCC are completely wrong and yet another false, baseless scare campaign from the coalition. Senator Cash. Um, could you take me through the consultation that you had with the ACCC in relation to the competition effects of the bill? Mm. The Minister. Um, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Um, the, uh, the ACCC, um, as you would recall, falls within the Treasury portfolio. The Treasury portfolio was consulted um, at, through uh, the drafting of the bill, um, and again, um, we've had just today the former chair of the ACCC, Mr. Sims, make the point that um, workplace relations laws and matters to do with the terms and conditions of employment are exempt from competition laws. And it was there in black and white in section 51, subsection 2. So, you know, yes, the Treasury was consulted. Um, ACCC falls within it, but it's pretty crystal clear in the law that there's nothing to be concerned about. Senator Cash. Well, again, I'm not raising these concerns. Businesses across Australia are raising the concerns, and they're not raising concerns in relation to the regime as it currently stands. They understand the regime as it currently stands. They are raising concerns in relation to the potential impact of multi-employer bargaining and the fact that competitors may well be compelled to bargain together. One of the purposes of the bill is to allow protected industrial action to occur across multi-employers at once. Um, can you just confirm that where a single enterprise agreement expires and bargaining does not commence, 
uh, that particular employer could be compelled to bargain uh, under this Act. The Minister. So sorry, Senator Cash. The, the hypothetical that you're putting forward is. Could you just repeat the last part of the question? Senator Cash. If you have currently have a single enterprise agreement and it is in force, I understand you are excluded. However, when that agreement comes to an end, uh, if you do not recommence bargaining, you could actually be compelled under this particular bill. The Minister. You could be compelled to be part of a multi employer bargain? Well, um, I know that. It, again, I know it suits the narrative to talk about businesses being compelled um, to be part of multi-employer bargains. Um, the, but as we've been talking over the course of the night, uh, before any business um, becomes party to, I mean, they, they might, as I say, they might actually choose to be part of a multi-employer bargain. It, it does happen. There are businesses who want to do this. Mr. Scavera, who I was referring to before, and his air conditioning and ventilation businesses want to be part of this so that they can stop a race to the bottom on wages. Um, but even for those businesses who don't want to be part of it, um, first of all, the majority of their workforce has to vote in favour of it, and then they have to satisfy all of those common interest uh, and, com and reasonably comparable business tests. Um, the, and in relation to the competition matters and the concerns that you're saying that businesses are raising, uh, you've had many opportunities over the last few months, Senator Cash, when, when I and others have responded to your questions and given you the facts of the situation. You've had many opportunities to go out there and uh, provide those facts to those businesses, um, but for reasons of your own you haven't done so and you keep coming back asking the same questions and, and fuelling the scare campaigns um, that businesses unfortunately are on the other end of. I'd encourage you and your colleagues to actually pass on the facts um, that you have been repeatedly told. Uh, rather than continuing to fuel scare campaigns on the basis of incorrect information that you've been repeatedly told is incorrect. Senator Cash. Um, what opportunity exists for an employer to exit the cooperative stream in the event that the collegiate negotiations they've entered into voluntarily move towards an arrangement that would make that employer's business unviable? resulting in probable business destruction and associated job loss. Additionally, how will these laws prohibit business conversations that would actually otherwise contravene Australian competition laws with respect to collusion? The Minister. Um, well, I've obviously dealt with the collusion point by saying that there is no risk of anti-competitive conduct action being taken. Um, in relation to the first point, uh, so as you say, the cooperative stream is available for uh, businesses and employees who want to be part of um, a cooperative agreement, um, usually signing up to an agreement that other, other businesses would be part of as well. Um, there is provision within the Act or the Bill uh, for businesses to withdraw from cooperative stream agreements uh, if they have the agreement of the relevant union. Um, and of course, uh, if that isn't the case, then, as is the case for many other agreements, that agreement that has been signed up to would expire at its expiry date. Senator Cash. Um, just again in relation to the common interest, um, I had asked you, can you confirm that to satisfy the common interest test all three factors do not need to be satisfied? And you said, no, they don't. So can I just confirm then, there is nothing in the legislation that makes the Fair Work Commission consider any other factor. So, for example, it could determine that there is a geographical uh, common interest and then move straight to the comparability test. 
Um, can you confirm that is true? The minister. Well, I think I think the more important point here, Senator Cash, is that um, to to be come part of a um, common interest or to be considered a common interest employer and therefore be part of a single interest um, agreement, what, what is required by the Act is that employers have clearly identifiable common interests um, and that the agreement is not contrary to the public or that the employer joining the agreement is not contrary to the public interest. That's the requirements. And, um, the remaining details, such as the geographical location, the regulatory regime and the nature of the enterprises, are simply examples of what the Commission may consider in determining whether employers have clearly identifiable common interests. So, um, you know, more than anything, what would need to be demonstrated is that a particular employer has clearly identifiable common interests. Um, uh, with the other employers and that it's not in, not contrary to the public interest um, for them to be joined. And of course, in addition, there's now a new reasonably comparable test as well. Senator Cash. And can I just confirm common interests as ultimately determined by the Fair Work Commission are not contrary to the public interest as ultimately determined by the Fair Work Commission? Minister. Correct. Senator Cash. Um, the next point is that the common interest could be the nature of the enterprise. Uh, can you give an example of two businesses which would be considered having the same nature? Minister. Um, Senator Cash, again, this is ultimately a matter for the discretion of the Commission. However, um, I'd remind you that there are a number of businesses who already make use of this system under your government's legislation. Um, the, and, um, for instance, I, I believe it's Catholic schools in a particular state or in, in, vari in various states and territories. Catholic schools have already made use of um, this system. So that has obviously been um, a matter that the, the Commission has already deemed um, to be uh, similar in terms of the nature of the enterprises. Senator Cash. So again, we go back to ultimately a matter for the discretion of the Fair Work Commission. Um, if I turn to the revised explanatory memorandum, it says that relevant factors include the relative size and scope of the relevant enterprises. Uh, so, can you then provide me with some examples, given you have put this into the explanatory memorandum, relative size and scope of the relevant enterprises? Can you please provide some examples of two businesses who may have, therefore, the same nature? The Minister. Um, again, Senator Cash, I'm not going to speculate on hypotheticals, um, but while just thinking about this um, I've, and talking to uh, my colleagues here, I've been reminded that not only um, do businesses already have the capacity to reach uh, multi-employer agreements uh, under this single interest bargaining stream under the current law that you administered, but that law which you administered left the discretion as to whether businesses should be allowed to be part of a multi-employer bargain to the minister. So you might like to make something of the fact that uh, items are being left to the discretion of the commission, um, but the system that you presided over gave you as the minister the discretion <coughs> to make this, these decisions. Um, so I think most Australians would feel a lot more comfortable with the Fair Work Commission making those, de those decisions rather than 
any minister of the day, um, whatever their political persuasion. Senator Cash. Uh, would any two retail stores be considered as having the same nature? The minister. I'm not going to speculate on hypotheticals. Senator Cash. I'm very much struggling to see how that could possibly be a hypothetical question. Part of the common interest test is clearly articulated in your legislation as being the nature of the enterprise. I am merely asking for further guidance in relation to what is the nature of the enterprise and would any two retail stores be considered as having the same nature? I am asking for guidance here. The retail sector would like to know. The Minister. I can't add to what I've already said. Senator Cash. Can I ask then? Would it therefore be a matter for the Fair Work Commission to determine? The Minister. I can't add to what I've already said. Senator Cash. Uh, so a butcher and a news agency are both retail stores. Would they be considered as having the same nature? The Minister. I'm not going to speculate on hypotheticals, and I'll be saying exactly the same thing for every such situation you want to put forward. Senator With Cash. all due respect, Minister, this is a significant change to Australia's industrial relations system. Businesses, employees, Australians have had little to no time to properly consider this legislation. Now, that is the right of your government, despite the fact that you were allegedly elected on a basis of integrity and transparency. These are very genuine questions that we are asking in relation to a test that you have put into your legislation. Under the section Common Interest, which is used in various positions throughout the Act, Part 21, so we're in the Common Interest Test, Single Interest Scheme, it lists three conditions for identifying a potential common interest geographical location, and I've accepted now there is no guidance. I accept that. Every single question you answered, and we can, we can go through the Hansard record tomorrow again, you've said it is left to the discretion of the Fair Work Commission. I accept that as an answer. I accept that. There's no, there's no hypotheticals here. These are genuine questions that employers and employees are asking. So in terms of now the next part of the common interest test that is set out in your legislation, the nature of the enterprise, if you are saying to me that would any two retail stores be considered as having the same nature, the answer is it's for the discretion of the Fair Work Commission. There is nothing more that I can add to the answer. There is nothing further in the bill that provides any guidance. Well, that's the answer. But I won't answer a hypothetical. How is that possibly a hypothetical when we're asking it on behalf of retail stores in Australia? Minister. Well, there are any number of hypotheticals that anyone can get up and give, uh, and I'm simply not going to speculate on those hypotheticals, whether it be butcher shops, retail shops, pizza shops, I was going to say video shops, but there's not many of them left these days, um, uh, no. burger shops, um, coffee shops. Um, we could be here all night with any combination of hypotheticals that you want to put forward. And what I will keep saying um, is that these are hypotheticals and I'm not going to speculate on them. Senator Cash. And yet, at the commencement of your answer, you were prepared to put on record that two schools were reasonable. So let's work now. Two schools are reasonable. Why is it a hypothetical to ask you, would two retail stores be deemed as having the same nature? Uh, the minister. Pretty simple, because the example of the Catholic schools is not a hypothetical. It is a fact that Catholic schools reached uh, a, an agreement, a multi-employer agreement, under your government, under your legislation. That is not a hypothetical. Um, 
There were other instances as well in other industries, albeit not that many because the system was so bureaucratic uh, and required ministerial discretion uh, that uh, it didn't work. Um, but, so that is a fact that that occurred, and of course that's different to a hypothetical. Senator Cash. Well, on behalf of the employers across Australia, and I don't have an issue that you have complete contempt for them. I think it's disgusting, but you clearly do have complete contempt for them, because they are the ones who are asking. Uh, no point. The point of order. The point I ask order. Uh, impugning motives. I ask Senator Cash to withdraw her remarks that I have contempt for anyone. I'm just, I'm just trying to answer some questions, and there are some questions that cannot be answered. Senator Cash. If Senator Watt is so insulted by the fact that I said he has contempt for business, if you're going business, to withdraw, you should withdraw without withdraw condition. It. But what I will say is, this is very, very disappointing. You are refusing to provide guidance about who could be compelled to bargain together. You are making changes to the system. You are actually standing here tonight in the committee stage of a bill, and I said to you at the beginning, I read out to you the tone in which I would ask the questions. The importance of questions when it comes to statutory interpretation. Because to date, despite the committee process, the farce of a committee process that was undertaken in relation to this bill, despite the alleged consultation that your government keeps saying it is undertaken with businesses across this country, there are hundreds of questions, I would put to you legitimate questions, that employers would like answered before this bill goes through. If you go to your own regulatory impact statement, you can't answer any of these questions. It's at the discretion of the Fair Work Commission. We've now moved from I'd rather you say it to the discretion of the Fair Work Commission because at least then employers have some idea. But to say it is hypothetical, quite frankly, you are mocking businesses in Australia who are the employers in this country. Your own regulatory impact statement says that if they get into this bargaining process, if you're a small business, you could be $14,500 worse off. If you are a medium-sized business, it was $75,000 until the $5,000 typo was found out, the $5,000 typo, so they'll need to fork out around $80,000 to get their own advice. And what is worse is you are now saying that we are delving into hypotheticals. So tell me, would two businesses in the mining sector be considered as having the same nature? The Minister. I'm not going to comment on hypotheticals. Um, you talked about Senator Cash uh, being disappointed, and I know what is really disappointing for the coalition is that wages might get moving again. That's what's really disappointing, and that's why we see this filibustering where, even after all this time, even after 10 years of suppressing wages, that's not enough for the coalition. Even after an election where Order. Australians voted for wages to get moving again, that's not enough for the coalition. Even though Order. we're seven months after the election, nearly, uh, and that's still not enough for the coalition, because the truth is that for the coalition, it's never the right time for Australian workers to get a pay rise. That's what's disappointing to the coalition. And you can ask every hypothetical question you want, you can soak up every minute you want. You can soak up every hour you want. We know you wanted to defer this legislation to next year, and if we'd gone along with that, you would have wanted to defer it to the next year after that and the year after that, because you would have, would, have, would have rather had two decades of wage suppression rather than one. But we're not going to let that happen. Um, we're, we're determined um, to change Australia's workplace laws um, from the decrepit system that you presided over which delivered 10 years of stagnant wages and low productivity for businesses didn't work for anyone. Um, it engendered conflict rather than agreements. It delivered low wages and low productivity, and that is going to change. And I'm surprised, frankly, 
that the coalition didn't hear the message from the Australian people at the election that they wanted something different. Well, we're going to deliver something different, and it's going to benefit not just workers but businesses around this country, and it's long overdue that that happened. Senator Cash. Uh, well, Senator Watt, I've said to you time and time again this evening, political commentary does not aid statutory interpretation. Political commentary, you are in government, this is your legislation, and you are answering the questions, Poli or failing to answer in this case. Political commentary does not aid in statutory interpretation. The situation we now find ourselves in is this. Given you have given no guidance whatsoever, in fact you have actually said they are mere hypotheticals, which anyone in Australia knows they are not. They are very genuine questions that are being asked. There is nothing stopping one Fair Work Commissioner, because everything is being left, and I quote, to the discretion of the Fair Work Commission, considering a butcher and a news agent to be related businesses with a common interest, and another commissioner making a different conclusion. So I invite you again, on behalf of in particular retailers in Australia, is there any further guidance that you can give to them tonight? Because you are right, this bill is going through. It is going through. This is the final opportunity that the opposition on the crossbench and the Australian Greens have on behalf of their constituents, the people we represent, and in this case tonight for me, it's employers who want to do the right thing by their employees. They actually do want to do the right thing by their employees, and they are saying, can you please get further guidance from the government so that we have half an idea about what we do? And the only thing that we have established tonight is, and I quote, it is ultimately a matter for the discretion of the Fair Work Commission. Now, I do understand Senator Pocock, Chair, does have some questions, and I will cede now to him. Senator David Pocock. Thank you, Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Minister. Can I take you to the definition of casuals in establishing whether they count towards the new threshold of 20 <coughs> employees in the amendment uh, for exclusion from the single interest bargaining stream? Would seasonal workers be included in this figure? Thank you, Senator Pocock. The Minister. Um, thanks, Senator Pocock, and again, thank you for your uh, cooperation uh, and negotiations with the government um, on the amendments that are now being put forward. The, ultimately, that question comes down to the, uh, whether the casuals are regular or not. Um, the way the legislation is already drafted um, is that, essentially, regular casuals would be considered within the 20 uh, employee cap. Um, but irregular casuals, so people who haven't worked there for a period of time or something like that would not, and that would apply whether we're talking about seasonal workers or other forms of casual employment. Senator Pocock. Th thank you, Minister. W would, uh, say, seasonal fruit pickers be re regular, or what's the, what's the line there? The minister. Thanks. So, uh, thanks, Senator Pocock. I'm, I'm just going to ask the officials to, to double check whether there's ever been any case law on this point to determine whether uh, seasonal workers are considered regular and systematic casuals. Because um, I talked about regular, but it's regular and systematic uh, casuals would be 
uh, considered employees for the purposes of that cap. Um, and I'm very much speculating here, and I'll, I'll, get, I'll get it. Yeah, so th that's, that's really how it works. Senator Pocock. Thank you, Minister. I'll, I'll await advice on that. Just on the 20 employee threshold, for someone who owns multiple uh, businesses, uh, for example, bakeries, do, does the, the headcount count across, say you have three bakeries, is it a cost across the three bakeries, or is each business um, on, on their own? The Minister. Um, if you're talking about three separate bakeries owned by the same person or entity, then the total employee numbers would be combined across the three. So if they had a total of 20 or more across the three businesses, then that would be 20 or more. Um, you don't have to have 20 or more in each of the three businesses. Senator Pocock. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Minister, can I take you to section 67 of the uh, supplementary EM where you note that uh, it's quite a bit to, to quote, but it, it's um, new, new subsection 2160C3B, as men would provide the fair commission with discretion to refuse to approve var variation of a single interest employer agreement to cover a new employer and a and employees, if the Fair Work Commission is satisfied that the variation should not be approved, having regard to whether the employee is bargaining in good faith for a proposed enterprise agreement covering substantially the same group of employees, the parties have a history of effectively bargaining for an enterprise agreement, and less than nine months have passed since the most recent nominal expiry date of such an agreement. Does the inclusion of consideration of bargaining history respond to spe uh, specific requests from stakeholders, and if so, whom? Minister. Um, thanks, Senator Pocock. Um, the short answer is yes, it does uh, result from uh, consultation and feedback from the stakeholders, and that in fact came at the Jobs and Skills Summit, where um, both business groups and unions um, arrived at a consensus that where parties, employer or employee or union, have that history of bargaining, uh, collect, uh, bar uh, what's the word? Um, effectively bargaining, um, that that exemption should apply. Senator David Pocock. Thank you, Minister. Uh, one more, and I'll hand back over to Senator Cash. Uh, in, in terms of the reasonably comparable um, terminology, can, can you please ex uh, elaborate on what the government intends where you say in, uh, in the EM section 53? The amendment would ensure that the Fair Work Commission must also be satisfied that the operations and business activities of the employer are also reasonably comparable. Minister. Um, thanks, Senator Pocock. As you'd be aware, that, that term is not defined within the legislation. Um, and again, I guess it would be a common sense test for the Commission to apply to, um, to determine whether a particular business is reasonably comparable to another. So I, I'm, I, I would expect that if they are in a completely different industry uh, or of completely different scale, um, then it would be difficult to see how the Commission could say that those two businesses are reasonably comparable. But again, that's a decision for the Commission. Senator Pocock. Just to uh, ask a, a supplementary on the scale, would, would that be the scale of uh, individual businesses? Or I, I know you're not dealing in hypotheticals, but um, 
indulge me with this because I don't know how to explain it. So say a uh, Woolworths versus IGA, all the IGAs added together, you have the scale, but how will that be treated? Minister. Um, well, to take, to take the specific example, IGAs, and, and I, don't, I can't really remember what the ownership structure of IGAs is, and whether, but I think they're sort of in the, each shop is independently owned, and I would think that the Commission would consider each of those businesses as separate ones rather than rolling, to the, to, rolling them together as a conglomeration. I mean, that, um, that, but again, it would depend on the, um, the terms and conditions of employment of those IGA employees. I actually don't know whether they all are part of, they have the same terms and conditions, whether they're the IGA in your suburb in Canberra or mine in Brisbane. Um, but if they are operated quite distinctly with different ownership, with different terms and conditions, I would expect that the Commission would consider them to be separate businesses uh, rather than rolling them together as one big group. Senator Cash. Thank you very much. Again, if I could just continue in relation to some guidance on the government's common interest test used in various positions throughout Part 21. And as I've stated, it lists conditions for identifying a potential common interest, geographical location, the regulatory regime, the nature of the enterprise and the terms and conditions of employment in those enterprises. Um, to date, we've established that it would appear to be uh, left to the discretion of the Fair Work Commission to determine those factors. Uh, just in relation to the terms and conditions of employment in those enterprises, um, can you confirm what this means in the context of determining whether employers have a common interest? Um, and can you provide some examples? Minister. Um, just as I am not in a position to elaborate further on um, the other tests being geographical location or regulatory regime, uh, I'm unable to elaborate further on that point either. Senator, just wait for the oh, call, Senator Cash. Sorry. Senator Thank Cash. You. Um, when you say you're unable to elaborate, is that because there is no further guidance provided uh, in any part of the explanatory memorandum uh, or the bill? And is it again going to be left to the discretion of the Fair Work Commission? Minister. Uh, I've answered these questions repeatedly. Senator Cash. Uh, this is the first question I think I've asked in relation to the terms and conditions of employment. I'm going through each of the elements of common interest, so I struggle to understand how you said you've answered these questions repeatedly when this is my first line of questioning on terms and conditions of employment. Um, can you therefore confirm that, and again, it will be left to the discretion of the Fair Work Commission? Minister. Well, well I'm making the point that for every element uh, we've gone over in detail, every element of the examples of what may amount to a common interest, and I've given the same answer over and over again, and I'll keep giving the same answer over and over again, so it's in everyone's interest that I refer back to those earlier answers. But again, I make the point that the overarching issue and requirement here is set out in the previous subsection, which is that employers have clearly identifiable common interests and that it's not contrary to the public interest to make the authorisation. That is, a, that is what is actually required. Um, and the remainder, uh, which Senator Cash wants to go through in detail, uh, are simply examples of what may amount to common interests and every answer I give will be the same. Senator Cash. Well, again, this is where it is very unfortunate because I've said to you, I've approached these questions tonight in a very deliberate manner. I've approached them from the perspective of statutory interpretation. The ability for those who are seeking to interpret your legislation in the very likely event proceedings are commenced, being able to refer to the answers that you have provided to the Australian Senate tonight. I really don't think my answers are going to be the same for the rest of the questions is going to help anybody in their efforts 
when it comes to statutory interpretation. So can I just confirm then, in relation to the terms and conditions of employment in these enterprises, which is a part of the common interest test or something that can be taken into consideration, you are not going to provide the Senate with any further information in relation to what this means in the context of determining whether employers have a common interest. Can I just confirm that? And then I can move on to my next line of questioning. Minister. Uh, what I can confirm is that there are a number of matters within the existing Fair Work Act that Senator Cash presided over as minister and that the former government presided over as the government for nearly 10 years, uh, which leave matters to the discretion of the Commission. Uh, so the approach that the government is taking in this case is no different uh, to what Senator Cash did as minister and the government of, what, of which she is, was a part did themselves. Senator Cash. Well, I beg to get diff up because I don't believe our government put forward the most egregious changes to the Industrial Relations Act uh, in decades. We were never in this position. You are the government that's bringing forward these changes. And so to be fair again to the employers and employees of this country who would like to do the right thing by each other, they have to now do the right thing under your legislation. You are unable to provide them with any further guidance. But I will just then confirm, as you've said, it will be left to the discretion of the Fair Work Commission. That was in relation to the terms and conditions of employment. Can I then turn to the other part of uh, the common interest test, the regulatory regime? Uh, can you please confirm what this means in the context of applying the common interest test? What does the regulatory regime actually mean? Minister. Um, in this case, I can be a bit more specific because I can rely on um, real life examples as opposed to hypothetical examples where uh, certain groups have reached multi employer agreements under the existing legislation which your government presided over. Um, what we're talking about here is regulatory regimes in the sense of childcare regulatory regimes or education regula regulatory regimes or healthcare regulatory regimes. Um, when those sorts of regulatory regimes apply, then that is a matter that could be considered by the Commission um, as demonstrating that particular employers have common interests. Um, but again, you know, this, this point about discretion is nothing new in Australian workplace law. Under the existing Act um, that your government presided over, that you as Minister presided over, Senator Cash, the Commission, for example, had the discretion whether to terminate protected industrial action. Your government didn't spell out exactly what the test was, exactly what needed to be satisfied for the Commission to determine uh, whether to pr uh, terminate protected action. It left it to the Commission to decide that, based on certain factors, exactly the approach we're taking here. The better off overall test that had been within the Fair Work Act for some time. It may have its detractors, it may need improving, and that's what we're doing in this legislation. But no previous government, including yours, including when you were the minister, ever spelt out categorically what better off overall meant. That was left to the Commission to decide. So if any employers or employees or unions are listening and concerned by this approach, then I imagine they would have had similar concerns about matters being left to the Commission to decide in the past. Senator Cash. Well, they weren't confronted with the situation that we are confronted with tonight, whereby you are opening up the single interest stream to multi-employer bargaining. You are potentially compelling employers who do not want to be part of these agreements. You are saying they can be compelled if they satisfy a common interest test. But to date, what we've had is this. The government cannot explain the common interest test. 
You cannot explain what a geographic similarity is. You cannot explain what a similar nature is. You cannot explain what the terms and conditions of employment in those enterprises are. And you've basically said it will be left to the discretion of the Fair Work Commission. Uh, is that the answer that you have for Australians? It will be left to the discretion of the Fair Work Commission. Minister. Um, Senator Cash, I'm not sure if you've forgotten the legislation that you presided over, Minister, which left any number of matters uh, to the discretion of the Commission, um, whether bargaining periods should be terminated, whether protected action should be terminated, whether a particular agreement was going to leave employees better off overall. They're just the ones that I've sat here and remembered myself over the last three minutes. I haven't even started looking through the Act to find every other reference to it. It's a, it's, it's a system that you applied, and it's a common system. You applied it. It's being applied here now. Um, and as I say, what would probably be helpful uh, is if you and your colleagues didn't run around the country scaring employers about things that won't happen um, as part of a political campaign. But that's the path you've chosen. Senator Cash. Well, and again, um, Minister, political commentary does not aid in statutory interpretation. Um, you keep criticising the former system, the system that was actually set up uh, by the former Rudd and Gillard governments. You are so critical of it, but you now say you're actually adopting the same approach. I find that a little ironic, don't you? In terms of how a business or employer exit the single interest stream. In the collegiate negotiations that we've been referring to, um, that they entered into voluntarily and have now been potentially imposed on them uh, by the Fair Work Commission, if this now moves towards an arrangement that would make the employer's business unviable, because we're no longer negotiating at an enterprise level. We are now potentially being compelled into negotiating uh, with our competitors, and we will be ending up with a one-size-fits-all approach. How does the employer under the Act actually exit the single interest stream? Minister. Um, thanks, Senator Cash. I, I think this matter is dealt with uh, by one of the new amendments, um, and it's, it would be in clause 53 of that. It refers to Schedule 1, item 637, on page 11 of the new amendments. And essentially, um, there are two ways for an employer to exit a single interest bargain. Um, while it is in force. Um, they both require application to the Commission, sorry, or exiting the authorisation, which is the terminology for being part of a—you get authorisation from the Commission to be part of a single-interest bargain. Um, the two ways which both require application to the Commission are um, demonstrating to the Commission that the, circumstances have ch that the employer's circumstances have changed. And the second is that the employee, a majority vote of the employees, supports exiting that agreement or that authorisation. Senator Cash. They only have to show one of those reasons. Minister. Um, yeah, they are the circumstances, and the the point about um, having a majority vote of employees that's only required for businesses with 50 or fewer employees, or it may be for, it's fewer than 50. It's available as an option for businesses with fewer than 50 employees. It, it's actually it's it would be um, it'll end up being subsection 251 to capital A. Um, 
which deals with the circumstances that allow the Fair Work Commission to vary an authorisation. Senator Cash. So this is an amendment that the government is bringing in. It provides an avenue for a business or an employer to exit the single interest stream. So, for example, in the event that the one size fits all agreement, the agreement that they now have to actually work under, uh, actually means that the employer's business becomes unviable, resulting in probable, say, business destruction and associated job loss. There is a mechanism in the bill for them to exit the single interest stream. They make an application to the Commission. They either have a majority vote of the employees or they must prove they have had a change in circumstances. How will they prove a change in circumstances? What does this mean? Minister. Uh, it's exactly the same test as is in the current Act, being the Act that you administered as the Minister. Senator Cash. Again, political commentary does not assist with statutory interpretation. These are very deliberate questions that are being asked. Employers have been unable to work this out. They've just seen the amendment. Could you then take me through what is a change in circumstances? They've been compelled into a single a multi employer agreement. The multi employer agreement has now resulted in their business becoming unviable. They wish to exit. They can a apply to the commission with the majority vote, or they prove they've had a change in circumstances. Can you take us through how they will prove this? Minister. Well, Senator Cash, I don't think you need me to explain that because it's in the act that you administered as the minister. It's exactly the same test. Um, and can I say that having uh, having like yourself, being an industrial lawyer, although I suspect probably on different sides of uh, matters, um, I have certainly had a lot of experience of unions and employees being willing to renegotiate terms and conditions of their employment when faced with um, serious viability concerns. Um, so I have every confidence that just as unions and employees have been able to approach these issues maturely within employers in the past, they'll continue to do so under the new system as well. Senator Cash. Uh, with all due respect, I may have been an industrial lawyer. You may have been an industrial lawyer. The problem with that is, though, that is not the small business or the medium business or the large business tonight seeking guidance from this part of the debate, merely referring them to a particular section of the Act because they don't have the time to now go and find a copy of the Fair Work Act, flick through to change in circumstances and work out what it means. So with all due respect, I would like an answer to, if an employer must prove they've had a change in circumstances, how will they prove it? Minister. Um, they'll prove it in exactly the same way they've had to prove it under the legislation that you presided over as minister, because remember, single interest in, uh, bargaining, uh, multi-employer bargaining, has been available under the legislation that exists now that you presided over as the minister. Section, section 251 of the current Act spells out uh, how uh, an employer can seek to vary a single interest employer. Uh, authorisation by removing the employer's name. Let, let me read you the current, so sec, current section 251, subsection 2. Your legislation, you are the minister. If an application is made under subsection 1 to vary an agreement, uh, an authorisation, the Fair Work Commission must vary the authorisation to remove the employer's name. If the Fair Work Commission is satisfied that, because of a change in the employer's circumstances, it is no longer appropriate for the employer to be specified in the authorisation. So if it's not OK for our government to not provide further detail, detail on that, 
then I guess my question to you, Senator Cash, is why didn't you fix it when you were the minister and had exactly the same wording in your legislation? Senator Cash. Uh, this is a fundamental change to Australia's industrial relations laws. We're actually talking about entering into multi-employer agreements that you have been compelled to enter into. When you consider the process of exiting, can you confirm if this will present additional costs to businesses? Minister. Um, I'm advised that uh, there is no fee to apply for this kind of a variation. In the same way, there was no fee to apply for a variation to the very multi-employer bargaining that was available through your legislation but didn't work. Um, and I'm glad you reminded me of the cost issues, Senator Cash, um, because that's of course been one of the other scare campaigns that you've been out there running, and you did it again tonight was about you know, the thousands of dollars that small businesses were going to have to pay to be part of multi-employer bargaining. Wrong. Wrong. Um, the whole point uh, of multi-employer bargaining is that it gives various employer groups, chambers of commerce, other associations, the opportunity to design agreements that would work across a range of different employers. And uh, I would hazard a guess that most small businesses or medium-sized businesses that want to take part in multi-employer bargaining might choose to take advantage of an agreement that has already been designed for them by an employer group, rather than deciding to go and engage a consultant at their cost uh, to help them through the process. If they choose to go and engage a consultant um, to help them through the process and incur the thousands of dollars that that involves, then that's a matter for them. But no one's forcing them to do that. No one's forcing them or compelling them to do anything. Um, uh, what we're offering is a different version of the same multi-employer bargaining that you saw fit to preside over, but apparently it's not okay when a Labor government tries to do it. Senator Cash. And I quote, we are not forcing or compelling them to do anything. How then under this legislation, if an employer does not want to enter into a multi-employer agreement, what is the pathway for joining them? Is there? Minister. As I've said over the course of the night, for any employer um, to become part of a multi-employer agreement, they have to meet various tests. Businesses that don't meet those tests won't be part of a multi-employer agreement. I know it doesn't fit the narrative. I know it doesn't help with the scare campaigns, but that's how the system works. Senator Cash. If I could now go to then the issue of costs. Um, if we could just go to the letter between the Office of Best Practice Regulation and the Department dated 21 October 2022, in which the Office of Best Practice Regulation provides its assessment of the government's regulatory impact statement on bargaining changes. Uh, the Office of Best Practice Regulation assessment was that the regulatory impact statement is adequate and therefore sufficient to inform decision. However, the letter states, to have been assessed as good practice under the guide, the regulatory impact statement would have benefited from further analysis of the potential impacts of productivity on productivity, real wages and other distributional impact, in particular on gender. Statements or evidence that the regulatory costs and their assumptions had been tested with stakeholders or otherwise an acknowledgement why this has not been undertaken. My question, therefore, is in light of the Office of Best Practices um, statement that good practice would have been for the department to have undertaken analysis on the potential impacts of bargaining changes uh, on real wages, why did this not happen?
Minister. Um, what I'm advised is that all the requirements of the Office of Best Practice Regulation, if, or whatever its exact name is, I think that's what it's called, um, were met. Um, so we, we believe that we've met all of those requirements. Senator Cash. Again, let me just put to you what the Office of Best Practice Regulation said. It said that their assessment of the RIS, the regulatory impact statement, is adequate and therefore sufficient to inform decision. However, the letter states to have been assessed as good practice under the guide, the regulatory impact statement would have benefited from further analysis of the potential impacts on productivity, real wages and other distributional impact, in particular on gender, statements or evidence that the regulatory costs and their assumptions had been tested with stakeholders, or otherwise an acknowledgement why this had not been taken. So can I, uh, can I ask then, in relation to that statement by the Office of Best Practice Regulation, what action did the government take? Mm. Minister. Well, again, I think, Senator Cash, you've answered your own question by saying that the first part of what was in, contained in that letter, which was that the words to the effect that the, the work that was done was adequate, it was what was needed. Um, and I know that you, a lot of these questions go to gender impacts of the bill, and I've already made the point that this bill is going to be doing an enormous amount to rectify uh, and close the gender pay gap um, that exists in Australia and that has been happening for a very long time. Um, and I know your government used to crow about closing the gender pay gap and always left out the bit that the reason that happened was that male wages were falling. Um, so the way to close the gender pay gap in the Liberal National Party world was to see wages decline for one part of the community. Um, what we actually want to see is, is the gender pay gap with both genders pay going up. That's the way to close the, the gender pay gap. And as I say, this bill does an enormous amount um, to address gender inequality in industrial relations in Australia. Uh, by including gender equality as an overarching object of the Fair Work Act, um, by um, implementing the government's election commitment to establish expert panels for pay equity um, and the care and community sector in the Fair Work Commission, backed by a dedicated research unit. Um, there's the issues around banning pay secrecy clauses and allowing staff to talk about their pay if they want to, which is particularly important for women, stamping out workplace sexual harassment. Um, uh, extending eligibility for flexible work requests to cover cases where the employee is pregnant. Um, any reasonable observer uh, would see that this bill is going to do more for gender equality in the workplace than we have seen in this country for a very, very long time. And it's a shame that the former government didn't do anything about these issues for the 10 years that it was in power. Senator Cash. And again, political commentary is of no assistance in statutory interpretation. Now, the issue I have with the answer that you just gave is you have stated that the regulatory impact statement says it is adequate and you've accepted that and therefore you've discharged your obligations. You then went on about um, a number of impacts in relation to gender. The issue I have is this, though. What the regulatory impact statement says is it would, the, the RIS would have benefited from further analysis of mm. the potential impact, in particular on gender. Given that statement and given your commitment in this bill to the improvements in gender equity, when the minister received this and it said further analysis of the potential impacts on productivity, real wages and other distributional impact, in particular on gender, what action was taken? <laughs> what did you do? Um, Minister? Um, again, Senator Cash, uh, many aspects of this bill, many core aspects of this bill are designed explicitly to uh, address 
and, and repair the gender pay gap and to improve the position of women in the workplace in a number of different ways over the course. Um, you know, I, I respect that the Office of Best Practice Regulation is entitled to its view. Um, its view was also um, that the work that we had done was adequate, I think was the word um, that you used, to meet its requirements. Um, I can also say that um, over the consultation and preparation of this bill, there has been extensive consultation with recognised academics, uh, women's organisations um, and a number of yeah, unions, employer groups. Um, yeah, unions do have a concern about women's place in the workplace and, and improving their position. Well, you raised unions. You raised unions, so I'm just trying to give you a bit of feedback that unions do have a long history of campaigning for women's rights in the workplace. It's one of the reasons I'm a union member. Um, the, uh, so we did consult with a number of different academics, unions, employer groups, women's organisations, civil society that have an interest in these issues, and we've taken on board their feedback. And that's why this bill does more for the, for, to improve the position of women in the workplace than we've seen for a very long time. Senator Cash. Again. The answer actually was not in relation to my question. That was some commentary. The Office of Best Practice Regulations Assessment, and we will get on to the levels, adequate is not as good as you're making it sound it to be, and we'll explore that shortly. What it said is the RIS would have benefited from further analysis of the potential impacts on productivity of real wages and other distributional impact, in particular on gender. What I'm asking is, when you read that, what did you do? And if the answer is nothing, that's fine. Yeah, I, I can't really add to what I've already said, um, other than to remind you that um, this bill is the result of lengthy and detailed conversations and consultation uh, with uh, a large number of academics women's organisations and other groups, employers and unions, um, who had some very valuable ideas about how we could fix the gender pay gap, and I'm really pleased that this bill picks it up. Um, Senator Pocock, I understand Senator Cash has got one more question in this line, and then I'll come straight to you. I have several more questions, but I'll ask one more question, then I, no, no, and then I will obviously, absolutely. Can I just confirm what was the gender pay gap when the coalition came to office in May 2013? What was the gender pay gap when you assumed office in May of this year? Minister. Uh, I'm happy to get you those figures, uh, and I'm also happy to get you the proof um, that any reduction in the gender pay gap that may have occurred over your time in office was because male wages in real terms or relative terms fell. So I'm not really sure that I'd be particularly proud uh, of any statistics that demonstrated that the relative pay of either gender fell, but I'm very happy to provide those figures to you. Thank you, Minister. Senator Papapokok. Thank you. Um, a, a question pursuing the line of questioning from Senator Cash. Um, the, we've heard this evening how the character of the Fair Work Commission is going to be very important to the way in which the promise of this bill unfolds and is realised. What expertise in relation to gender, uh, to equal remuneration, um, uh, job security and so on, what kind of expertise is going to be essential in the Commission uh, to, to realise the promise of the bill and, in particular, the expertise in the two new panels established, uh, one on care and community and one on gender equality? Minister. Um, thanks, Senator Pocock, and I again recognise your uh, many years of uh, working and campaigning on these issues. Um, uh, you're dead right. Uh, it is important that uh, an understanding and appreciation of uh, gender issues and gender inequality is a really important um, characteristic, I think, and the government thinks of uh, members of the Commission. Um, and you're probably aware that one of the things that we're proposing to do here is to establish two uh, particular panels 
um, one concerning pay equity and one concerning um, I think it's care and community sector. Uh, and we would certainly expect that the commissioners who are involved in those panels would have a particular understanding of these issues. So you know, I do think that it improves decision making uh, on gender inequality issues if the people making these decisions, being the commissioners, have a, a deep understanding of these issues. That, that's certainly the path we want to go down. Senator Pocock. I'll consider I'm oh, sorry. Please. Thank you. Um, have you given any consideration to evaluation of the expertise uh, of the Commission and its um, uh, ability to uh, enact the new objects of the, of the Act and so on um, to make sure that it is uh, doing what we want it to do if, if the bill was passed with those new objects? Minister. Um, thanks, Senator Pocock. Those, those two panels that I was referring to, the Pay Equity Expert Panel and the Care and Community Sector Expert Panel, um, as you may be aware, um, in the budget this year the government announced $20 million to establish those panels uh, with a dedicated research unit. And I've been reminded that um, uh, the relevant skills and experience uh, is a requirement of appointees to the Commission, um, so again, or, or to its panels. So I would fully expect um, that the people who will be involved in these panels will have those sorts of skills and backgrounds. Um, and there was some discussion in the committee uh, that took evidence in relation to the bill about the nature of appointments to those panels and to the Commission more broadly um, in relation to part-time and, and full-time appointments. Do you anticipate part-time appointments that can draw on the academic expertise, the general industry and union expertise that's out there on, on these issues? Minister. Um, yes, Senator Pocock. Uh, I mean, it would be somewhat ironic if we weren't open to part-time membership of these sorts of panels that are considering gender inequality issues. Um, and uh, what I'm advised is that uh, expert panel members can be appointed on a full-time basis, um, but also can be appointed on a part-time basis for a five-year term. Um, and the part-time nature of this appointment reflects the short-term nature of the tasks these experts are appointed to perform, for example, the annual wage review. But, but the, the president also will have the power to appoint full-time members to panels um, based on their expertise, and that will give the commission some flexibility with its resourcing. Senator Cash. Uh, just if we could uh, continue on <coughs> the regulatory impact statement uh, and the letter between the Office of Best Practice Regulation and the Department dated the 23rd of October 2022. Um, in terms of the Office of Best Practice Regulation and Assessment Tiers, I understand that there's actually four. Uh, you, are, you accept or you've said that you are happy with adequate. Can I just confirm that? Minister. Well, I, didn't, I didn't express a level of happiness or unhappiness. What I said was that um, the, the letter that you read from uh, stated that the office considered that the work that we did was adequate. Senator Cash. Uh, adequate for decision making. There is actually a big difference. Mm. Uh, in terms of the Office of Best Practice Regulation Assessment tiers, uh, there are actually, I understand, four insufficient adequate, good practice and exemplary practice. Let's go through them again. Insufficient, bad, bad. Adequate, good practice, we're starting to get there, and exemplary practice. Page 55 of the Australian Guide to Regulatory Impact Analysis describes adequate as follows. Means the RIS is sufficient for a decision, but contains a number of shortcomings in its analysis 
and or the policy development process used to underpin the analysis, such as not conducting a reasonable level of consultation. I go back to the Office of Best Practices assessment, and it says it would have benefited from the regulatory impact statement. Statements are evidence that the regulatory costs and will we'll pursue them and their assumptions had been tested with stakeholders or otherwise an acknowledgement why this was undertaken. What action did the government take in that regard, given in particular the fact that the RIS is merely assessed as adequate, it means it has a number of shortcomings in its analysis and or the policy development process used to underpin the analysis, such as not conducting a reasonable level of consultation. So when presented with statements or evidence that the regulatory costs and their assumptions had been tested with stakeholders or otherwise an acknowledgement why this had not been taken, what action did the minister take? Minister. Uh, well, thanks, Senator Cash. And again, uh, I thank you for pointing out that um, the guidance note or, or whatever it was that you're quoting from says that um, when uh, the work is deemed to be adequate, that that is, I think your words were sufficient uh, on which to base a decision. Um, so it sounds to me as if the work that was done was deemed to be sufficient to make a decision, and that's what we've done. Um, uh, I think it would be probably interesting to find out, Senator Cash, um, whether Re uh, regulation and legislation that occurred while you were a minister um, ever hit the adequate note as well, and I suspect that that's probably been the case in most ministers' careers. That sometimes it's deemed to be a higher level or a lower level, and I suspect we could find examples where that's happened when you were the minister as well. Um, but I mean, given that this point ultimately relates to gender inequality, um, I've already given um, references to the extensive work that occurred. Uh, to ensure that the Act delivered on gender equality in the workplace, and I've already run through the numerous ways in which the Act does that, or the bill does that. Senator Cash. It also related to the impacts on productivity and real wages. Um, are you therefore satisfied, in light of the Office of Best Practice Regulations assessment, that an appropriate level of consultation has been undertaken uh, for the bargaining changes? Minister. Uh, yes, I am. Um, the, as you have said, the office found that the work that was undertaken was adequate and that it was sufficient to base a decision on. We've made a decision and we're now getting on with legislating so that we can get wages moving again. Senator Cash. Um, does the department usually only aim for an adequate assessment? Minister. Uh, I'm sure that I, I don't know what the department's practice is, but I'm sure that uh, it always aspires to the highest level. I'm sure it always aspired to the highest level when you were the minister, Minister Senator Cash, and I'm sure that sometimes it got there and sometimes it got to adequate. Senator Cash, it's a pretty stunning answer, I have That's to say, fair. but not in a good way. Uh, given that. We all accept that adequate, good enough to inform a decision, too bad, so sad, about what the Office of Best Practice Regulation actually said. Why did the government not take any further in, um, action when it was actually advised by the Office of Best Practice Regulation that the regulatory impact statement could be improved? Mm. You actually have had an opportunity to provide an updated explanatory memorandum as well. Is there a reason that this was not addressed? Mm. Minister. Um, there's been, I mean, it would be false to suggest, as I think you're suggesting, that consultation did not continue after that letter was received. Um, there has been extensive consultation both prior to and after the receipt of that letter. Um, but again, we make no apologies for bringing this legislation to the chamber to get it passed before Christmas, because Australians have been waiting for 10 years to have a, an IR system which delivered fair pay rises so that people could keep up with the cost of living. 
I know that your government had a different policy. I know that your government's policy was to keep wages suppressed um, and to keep productivity low. We don't want that. We don't want to wait. We don't want workers or businesses to have to wait a day longer than is necessary um, to get the system working, so that we get wages moving and that we get productivity moving, which will benefit the Australian economy overall. Senator Cash, <coughs> Minister Watt, this bill will pass the Senate probably tomorrow. I have no issues with that. But tonight it is our opportunity and tomorrow to actually ask detailed questions in relation to the impact of the legislation, the absolute confusion mm. that is out there mm. in relation to the changes. And to date you are just making, quite frankly, a mockery of the entire process. Mm. I note that the Office of Best Practice Regulation has criticised the department for not providing evidence that the regulatory costs and their assumptions have been tested with stakeholders. If you go to page 50 of the regulatory impact statement, which says that the impact on employers of option two, improving access to single and multi-employer agreements. This section refers to a number of assumptions, and we will go through the assumptions, that underpin the department's estimate that the cost of multi-employer bargaining changes, and I do want to pursue an answer you gave previously uh, when I said the cost to small business was around $14,500 and you yield out not true, and I would like to pursue why you say that's not true. Um, so this section refers to a number of assumptions that underpin the department's estimate that the cost of multi-employer bargaining changes per business would be. And if you go to page 53 uh, of the regulatory impact statement, it actually takes, sets them out. It actually says this, therefore the total cost per business using these estimates are cost of bargaining per business plus cost of external consultants per business. Small business, 14,638. Medium business, 75,148. We now know that's not true. There was a $5,000 typo, <laughs> which actually increased, not decreased, the cost of business. And the cost of a large business, $94,311. So when you say in relation to I said the cost of bargaining per business plus cost, uh, as outlined in your RIS, was for a small business $14,638. Why is that untrue? Mm. Minister. Um, thanks, Senator Cash. Uh, the, the reason why I was saying that you were wrong earlier and that you're wrong now is that you have you and your colleagues have repeatedly cited those figures as being so-called evidence um, that any business that wants to take part in um, the type of bargaining that's being put forward here will incur those costs, and that is not true. Um, that assumes that the relevant business decides to go and get its own consultants, its own lawyers, its own this, its own that. Uh, when that is not the only option they have available to them. As I said earlier in the debate, what I would expect would happen is that we would see um, some of the employer groups, whether they be industry-based or cross-industry, develop uh, agreements uh, as a service to their members, that their members, the individual businesses, may choose to then join up to. Um, and if businesses decided to do that, then they wouldn't need to incur uh, the cost of external consultants. Um, all it would cost them is their usual, usual membership fee for that association. Um, and those employer groups already provide an extensive range of industrial relations services to their members, and this would become another one um, that they could offer. So to be claiming, as you and your colleagues have now for a number of weeks, that any business that wants to participate in this is going to be up for tens of thousands of dollars is just completely untrue, and you know that. But you continue to say it because it feeds your scare campaigns, it feeds your narrative, but it's just not true. Um, and in addition, what you've failed to point out again is the following words that are in the regulatory impact statement, which are that the significant benefits of being covered by an enterprise agreement and the cost that may be associated with remaining covered by a modern award 
outweigh the additional cost for businesses to engage with the new multi-enterprise bargaining streams. So I think if you're going to be citing things from the regulatory impact statement, A, you might owe it to people to be complete, and B, you might owe it to people to not misrepresent what it's saying, because people do not have to choose this option if they don't want to. Senator Cash. You've clearly never met a small business, if that's your <laughs> answer. So Julie Collins, Let's now please. talk about some further assumptions, seeing as you're all over business and you're all over what businesses are going to do. The first is, how many small businesses in Australia are a member of an association? Minister. Uh, well, the number would be extremely large, and what I base that on is the, is the repeated comments is the repeated comments from employer groups that they speak for small businesses in this country. So if, 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 if the likes of Aki, COSBOA, AIG, all the other employer groups that say that they represent small businesses or medium-sized businesses in this country, then they must represent a very large number and they must be very capable of developing, uh, they must be develop, uh, capable of developing agreements that their members could then sign up to. Um, and frankly, if they don't, um, I think that is part of their responsibility to their members, is to provide them with that industrial relations assistance so that they can uh, have that assistance from their member body. Senator Cash, Hi. before we finish tonight, there is another assumption I'd like to pursue with you. Yeah. I note the government's assumption that on average 15.2, I'd love you to explain the point two to me because I'm a little confused about the point two. So 15.2, so if we could go through the point two shortly, employers will bargain together under the one multi-employer agreement. Mm. Where did the 15.2 come from and what does the point two represent? Minister. Sorry, what, which document are you quoting from, Senator Cash? Uh, your regulatory impact statement <laughs> that was assessed as adequate. Which someone had to. Minister. Uh, I'm getting some further advice on this, but uh, what I understand at the moment is that uh, it's based on the average number of businesses that have joined multi-enterprise agreements under the system that you presided over as minister. Senator Cash. I also, so the government's assumption is that on average 15.2 employers will bargain together under one multi-employer agreement and that they will pool their money and hire one or two consultants, one or two, throw it in the air, one or two, three or four, doesn't expensive. matter. Costs do get more expensive the higher we go, though, to represent them during negotiations. I personally find that fascinating, colleagues, because competitors who are forced to bargain are going to say, we'll just give you all our information and then you can negotiate between the 15.2 employers and come up with a one-size-fits-all agreement. But my question to you is this. <laughs> Did, you go, uh, did the government put this proposition to employers? No one can. Well, again, I'll get some further advice on this, but it's sounding to me as if the department based uh, these figures and these assumptions on the experience uh, of what has occurred under the system that you presided over. So. Um, if that's the system that happened under you, when you were in government, were you critical of that as well, or is it only when it's a Labor government that seeks to do this? That wasn't the question I asked. Uh, uh, Sen Senator Cash, wait for the call. Minister, you finished? Yes. Yeah. Senator Cash. Um, that wasn't the question that I asked. The question I asked was, did the government put this proposition to employers? We aren't talking about the regime that was put together by former Prime Ministers Rudd and Gillard. We aren't talking about the regime that exists today. 
We are talking about the regime that will exist when this legislation passes. So you've made some assumptions that, on average, 15.2 employers will bargain together under the one multi-employer agreement that they will pull their money. Now you've got to remember, in this scenario, the 15.2 could have been compelled to bargain. That is not something that currently occurs. That they will only hire one or two consultants, so they might be in competition, the 15 of them. But each one of them is going to say, "We'll only hire one or two consultants to represent them during the negotiations." Did the government put this proposition to employers? Good question. Minister. Well, the, as I say, um, if it is the case, and I'll confirm this, that this is largely based on experience to date, then I guess what we're dealing with there is facts rather than hypotheticals, um, and they are facts that arose under the system that you presided over as the minister, uh, and that would seem to me to be a pretty good place to base assumptions, and I guess we'll resume in the morning. That's a very good segue to colleagues. It being 11 p.m., I shall now report to the Senate. Uh, the committee reports progress. In pursuant to the order, the Senate will now adjourn without debate. The Senate stands adjourned and will meet again tomorrow at 9 a.m.